Here's day two with the one and only Mr. Jim Matthews. Coming straight from the cockpit, it's another episode of Lunatic Fringe with the fucking pilot. Ready, set, go! All right, back in the can for another edition of Lunatic Fringe Into the Void. And we're actually, this one's kind of by request, because this gentleman and I had an opportunity to have a, a conversation, that's probably about, I don't know, 15 episodes ago, maybe even 20 episodes ago. And uh, I've had so many questions and so many people commenting on the podcast that he and I had uh, that I've decided we've we've got to do this round two and uh, uh, cover some of the more ridiculous things that people that know him were upset that we didn't cover. Uh, so without further ado, tell them, who the fuck are you? This is <laughs> Jim Matthews. Jim Matthews, Mr. Glass. <laughs> you know, when, when, when we talked about doing part two, I didn't actually think we were actually going to do a part two. Of course I was going to do uh, part two. Well, it, I, I have to say your, your podcasts have gotten amazing. And some of the content, I think, has been, for the sport, incredible. Well, and uh, and especially the, a, couple of, a couple of them have been really, uh, I don't know, the last one you did was, uh, was you said it was Ryan? Ryan Graney, yeah. That ended up being really motivational for me. So, I mean, it was a, the way he just kind of looked at life, looked at injuries, looked at different ways of, of uh, going through periods of his life. It, 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 it spoke to me differently than just a skydiving podcast. That nice. was cool. Nice. Well, it's kind of, I mean, that's always kind of been the idea behind the podcast is that it's not necessarily just about jumping. It doesn't even have to be about jumping. It's kind of the mentality that goes into the sport and, and what drives skydivers and extreme sports enthusiasts in general. And of course, he having done everything, the climbing and, and the, all the skydiving, the base jumping. And I mean, let's face it, the way he did drugs and partying was definitely a fucking extreme sport. So, you know, it, it all kind of, it blends together and it gives, I mean, skydivers and extreme sports people are a, a unique blend, you know, so they make it easy, man. I'm, I'm just shooting the same shit I always have. Which is interesting because it, like we were talking about before we started, how some of the people that, that I listen to that I know, I, I, first of all, listening to like even Ryan talk about the monkeys, hearing the background story before we knew them as the monkeys, you know, right. hearing, hearing pre, you know, how they, how they got into to climbing and that kind of right. stuff. Listening to Ray Farrell talk. That was a side of Ray. I knew you guys were going to have that conversation. That's a side of Ray I'd never heard. He sure. sounds like he is loving life in Florida. Yeah, a different um, guy, he's right? Relaxed. It's a different kind of a yeah, just a different vibe coming from the guy. And then Billy Sharman. Love you, Billy, but that was not Billy Sharman on that podcast. That was an adult. I don't know what you did to Billy, but good Lord, he sounds right? mature, yeah. and that's odd. You know, it's kind Very of funny, mature. too, because uh, um, I talked to him on the podcast, and anytime I'm talking to him about the drop zone and about the operation, he shifts gears into uh, Billy Sharman DZO professional, <laughs> you know, and... And getting shit done, and he's he's very professional and well thought out in everything that he's doing. But every time no, I, I see him that, in person, we're doing always, shots and doing stupid shit. <laughs> that's always been in him, though. I mean, because he he had those moments. I mean, he's he's even when he lived with us, he would have his moments where he'd have all these wonderful ideas. But then by the end of the afternoon, it was shit show, Billy. And you know, he was one of the best roommates I think I ever had. Of course. Well, I, I mean, it was. I think I think shit show Billy kind of took a, a back seat to, uh, with Angie and the baby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that yeah, that would mature. Yeah, yeah that would yeah. mature. And and then the drop zone and everything. But again, every time I've seen him uh before and since the podcast when he's away from the drop zone, he's also traveling, which means that uh, uh his DZO hat is left at home and he lets his hair down a little bit. So it's back to shots and stupid comments and stuff. So but yeah, right man, I, I've been really lucky. I've I've had a shitload of amazing guests uh that have have uh, um been willing to come and sit down and talk to me and i just released one with brian germain who you of course know and yep. and uh, i've got some, that one. some great ones lined up but wendy smith has agreed she's going to come on and talk to me and so a lot of really cool people coming up as well and honestly it's all about them i know you already talked about uh base camp but i mean i i there, there was a couple of avalanches that happened, and I, I didn't know enough about the area and the terrain and the, and where you exactly where you were and the sides you went up. So I got really involved. I first of all never knew you had that kind of a passion growing up 
to do it. Yeah. I just thought this was one of your bucket list items. And then the other thing was there was a couple of avalanches that I read about. And one of them, I got really excited thinking, oh, my God. And I was reading about one that had happened like three months before. I did not know. So I just assumed, OK, I read it wrong and it didn't happen. I did not know you actually experienced one. That's amazing. Yeah, well, I happened to be right next to. And I mean, for all intents and purposes, for a, a, a an avalanche in the base camp uh, area of Everest. This was an extremely mild one, uh, but it was on the face opposite to Lhotse uh, on the trail going to base camp, probably about to... But, how, but, but for perspective, it was it far enough away to where you thought, oh, that is just beautiful, and then... Literally, it's so far away, you don't think this could possibly... And then no, you said, no, next no. thing you know, you're getting dust. It was far enough away that I thought it was beautiful, but it was also, a, okay, that doesn't look like it can come this direction, but let's kind of be ready. Yeah, and I, we ended up getting dusted a little bit by it, which... And it That's was just... Said, yeah. yeah, and it was just myself, I because I did the whole thing by myself. I didn't have porters or, or Sherpas. It was just me. Um, but there were a couple of other folks on the trail actually making their way back from base camp when that happened. Uh, so I had well, a couple... so, Tim, so back to living vicariously through you. <laughs> Every picture, all the beautiful sights, everything else made it look like what we see on TV until you posted the video of you gassed oh, walking yeah. into – was that walking into base camp? I was walking into base camp, yeah. Never heard your voice like that. <laughs> never heard you gas. And I've seen you run. I've seen you work out. I mean I've never heard that. And I thought – Good Lord. Yeah, it's not man. it's not just a walk up to the base camp and hang out and party in, in a tent with a bunch of cocktails. No, man, it's one third the oxygen to sea level. You know, it's and yeah. unfortunately I had gotten up there in the first couple of days that I was doing the hiking. Um, the air is very cold. Um, and very dry. And you talked about the cough. Yeah, yeah, but during the day, um, you're still sweating in the sun. So although it's cold, you know, I mean, you're seeing your breath and everything, that air is so dry, um, you're still not thinking, I need to cover up. And the big thing is you should always have your face and nose covered when you're hiking because breathing that really cold air in is what they think causes what they've nicknamed the kumbu cough. Uh, and the kumbu cough because that's the region uh, that you're hiking in. Yeah, and I remember you talking about that and the two things that stuck out to me about that were one watching the i would have loved to have seen the look on your face with the guy with the greasy hands putting his hand in the tea oh. and thinking how gassed and 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 bad did that cough have to be do you know you were going to be crap in your pants for three days going i don't care i have to drink that right oh, now. oh yeah no i didn't give a fuck i didn't give a fuck then, i'm like dude if, if if that guy had dipped his dick into that tea <laughs> i said i would have fucking drank it and then the other question i had was <laughs> I've always been fascinated with what the hell was Hillary and those guys wearing? I mean, they didn't, they had canvas. Dude, with they were wool wearing line. fucking wool sweaters and leather boots and shit. It's, it's nuts. It, yeah, no, it's crazy. It's kind of one of the, when you get into the history of Everest, you find out that uh, uh, when you're climbing, there's, there's bodies scattered all over Everest. Yeah. And you can actually tell uh, roughly what year uh, the body is from the clothing that they've got on. And so you'll hike oh. past people that are still wearing leather boots and stuff because they've been on that mountain forever. Uh, I was actually sparked to to want to go see Everest because of the book Into Thin Air, which I read oh. 23 years ago. Um, and so... <laughs> If you think about it, the technology for outdoor equipment between 23 years ago and now, of course, has changed quite a bit. And the two guys that spurred me to want to go up there were Rob Hall and Scott Fisher, who both yeah. died in 96. Um, so, um, and they're still sitting on that mountain, you know, still in the same place where they fell over dead. Yeah. Um, you know, and it, so the whole thing was very surreal, especially when two days outside of base camp, you hike past the memorial, past you know, the, the marker for Scott Fisher and Rob Hall. And it was, it was all for me, very emotional. Uh, and then you, yeah, see, I saw, the, I, I saw the movie first and I don't remember who it was, but somebody, saw, I, I, I ran into one of the monkeys. I don't remember where it wasn't Ammon and it wasn't, it wasn't Nick, of course, it was someone else that recognized me Probably evil. and it was in the Bay area. Probably evil. It, it, I can't remember. He recognized me because I was on one of his first AFS and he said something like, uh, and, and I was asking if he's still climbing and stuff. And he talked a little bit about Everest and that because the, they had had that that uh, that nasty avalanche. Yeah. And he mentioned there's a documentary. And that's when I went and watched the documentary about what happened with the two of them and, and realized that the movie had dramatized it a bit. But it was a lot more traumatic for them and, and having lack of communication with them and then getting old to rob and having to hold the two phones together. Oh, I mean, the whole thing yeah, was just man. I mean, the, the fact that uh, that Rob Hall's daughter was named <laughs> via radio with him sitting, right. you know, just below. Low the Hillary step dying. No, um, well, he knows. I mean, they're telling him get up, and he he knows. Oh no, he 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 knew there was no way. 
and yeah. again, so when when I with my cough and everything, when I'm stumbling my way into to a base camp, I had a few friends that were like, "You're going to get there and decide you want to climb it because you're fucking crazy." And my response, I almost, was, I I knew I see until you posted that video, I thought you're going to do something dumb. You're yeah. going to get up there, someone's going to approach you, you're going to freaking say, "I've got money, I'm going." Yeah, and so, then I thought. And I a thought lot of, you'll go halfway, or you'll do you'll do the the what what do you call it? This what are the next the base camps that go up? Yeah, well, you've got uh, camp one, two, three, four, and then the, your summit. So attempts. I figured I'll, I'll, I gave I was I was fifty fifty. You were at least going to go for one of them. Yeah, just no, you're there. no. Well, there were two good reasons why not. First off, I went during the off season, so there's actually no expeditions going to the top in October and November. Uh, okay. That all happens at the beginning of the year. Uh, so there was that going for me that I I couldn't be stupid because there's no way through. You couldn't even get through so the you ice. Didn't, you didn't. So you didn't go to party at base camp. You went to experience it. Yeah, yeah. No, there's and there's nobody at base camp now. It's it literally was just for the experience and to meet that mountain See, I didn't face know. to face. Yeah, and so, I did not know that. That's more of a personal experience. I oh, thought yeah. it was literally you, you went up to a whole big crowd of people and no. there was going to be a little bit of relaxing and partying. No, that's kind of – that's Namchi Bazaar, which is days back down the hill. That's kind of where the party's okay. at. But no, uh, okay. it was all of that. And then uh, when I got into base camp, um, heaving like I was between the cough and, and – uh, um, and not feeling very well when I got into base camp, uh, my very first thought was, because I was so wrecked getting into base camp, I'm like, you got to be fucking kidding me. This is where it starts. <laughs> what's the, what's the, we'll move on, but what's the, what's the recovery time? So you, you get into base camp, you're gassed. Does it take a day or two to kind of get acclimated well, to where you are or I mean, you just go? No. So uh, acclimation doesn't come quickly because people think that your, your body starts developing more red blood cells uh, relatively quickly, but it doesn't. It takes well over a month to actually start getting more red blood cells. What your body does is it compensates by upping your heart rate and making you breathe faster. Uh, and so I had a bunch of sat phone and t told you call me as much as you want tell me all about it yeah, i'm gonna man. be right here it was bar. wild you know i mean uh, um i i would be i, I think i spent just a, almost three weeks above fifteen thousand feet uh so you're you're quite high the entire time and i would lay down and it's cold the, and dry. the night before i went to base camp i was laying in bed and i i took a little oxygen meter to find out you know what my blood oxygen levels were make right. sure it was safe because uh altitude sickness is a real concern and I'm laying in bed, and my resting heart rate was 108, and I was that's breathing crazy. like I was running, and I was falling asleep. Like, that's that's just, that's how you your heart is just thumping in your chest. Yeah, and you also mentioned that you don't get any good sleep, and you keep wake, waking up because you think you're almost like sleep apnea, it sounded like, but yeah, worse. I mean, exactly you keep waking up. You keep yeah. jerking yourself awake because your body is like, you're suffocating, and then you <laughs> sit up and go, oh, fuck no, I'm just still at 15,000 feet. So yeah, it was, I mean, it was absolutely amazing and it was really difficult and, um, I'll never, ever, ever make the attempt to climb Everest, but I am going to go back to Nepal and I want to climb the little bunny slope, the little beginner slope, which is called Island Peak, which is just above 20,000 feet. So I want to say that's I, the bunny slope. That's the bunny slope. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the one that if you tell any true <laughs> Alpine climber that you're going to go climb Island Peak in Nepal, they'll just go. They call the bunny slope. Yeah. They'll yeah, be okay, like, really? Yeah. Okay. Have a nice stroll, you know, but for me, it'll kick my ass. Which, again, it was the, the whole experience for me was amazing going over uh, Chola Pass, which is a little higher than base camp, and then having to climb up a small but still substantial <laughs> glacier with fucking crampons on. That was pretty intense. Right. Yeah. And the cool thing was I did it all by myself. So I, I get to say I carried all my own shit and I did it all on my own. And I didn't get uh, to all the destinations that I wanted more than anything because of the cough. Uh, and I just, yeah, I just was, I was trying to be smart about it. Right. Yeah. But still. Well, that puts a whole new, that puts a whole new perspective on it. Cause I think for most people, and I, I'm speaking at least for myself, but for most people, I think it definitely, we see it on TV. We read about it in, in climbing magazines and, and it, it looks easy. It looks yeah, not easy, I should no, say. It just, man, it just looks like at least base camp looks like it's something that everybody wants to do, and the people you talk to that want to do it are not that fit. All and right. So, it, well, so now, anyways. See, now, that being said, though, I had little Sherpas carrying 10 times my body weight and, and smoking a fucking cigarette while doing it, and literally, and I'm not shitting you, racing little old ladies over the rocks to make sure I got to the village before them so I could get a room. 
So it, it, the funny thing <laughs> is the, the training that goes into it really doesn't mean a whole lot because it's how you react to altitude. And altitude right. was, it made me fucking work for it, you know? Um, base camp was no joke. It was really, really hard work. Um, and it, I always had an amazing respect for anybody that uh, um, had the balls to attempt to climb Everest or Amadablam or any of the major peaks up there. But having been there now and, and how hard it was just to get to base camp, the thought of making it to the summit is uh, it's godlike. It's insane. Yeah. Yeah, it really yeah. is. And even for the people that are, are basically paying to buy a ticket and they're being guided up by Sherpas, I know that that's a big thing in the climbing world, that you're not really a climber. You've just been guided up there. You still got to put one foot in front of the other. And fuck me, man. That's that's some shit. So hats off to anybody that's that's actually made it or attempted to make it. And there's a whole so lot you, of... So you, there's so a, even the people that are spending as much money as they possibly can. And so that's where, that's where they, I mean, so, cause that, that's the other thing I think that gets dramatized is it, it sounds like if you've got enough money and you're, you're working in Silicon Valley and you just want to go to the top of Everest, if you pay the right guide and the right person that, that you get enough oxygen and they'll take all the crap and put all the gear on you and up you go. Yeah. And I mean, I mean it's not like a tandem. No, no. I mean, to a, to a, uh, uh, in a partial sense, that's actually true. They, they really are paying for someone to carry absolutely everything. You're literally only getting your own body weight up there. You know, I had 22 right. kg of shit in my backpack. By the way, pack light when you go to Everest, not like me. I was an yeah, idiot. I remember you saying that you took too much crap. I took way too much shit. Um, but, you know, I mean, you still got to put one foot in front of the other. You, you've still got to physically get yourself up there. And the big thing, of course, with getting down from there is you've got to get yourself down. There is no rescue from the death zone. That's it. If you can't get right. yourself down, you're dead. That's it. Right. Nice knowing you. You become your own monument. <laughs> yeah. Imagine that you're taking a tandem and they you're you're taking a tandem that you're trying to teach how to jump and they don't fucking pull the handle. So you just disconnect them and let them go. Oh. <laughs> You didn't pull. And then you got, yeah. <laughs> uh, Davis, at least we could move areas to land and just, oh. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah, that was, that was my trip, dude. It was, it was, uh, uh, it was pretty amazing. I didn't, uh, uh, you know, I did nothing outstanding at all other than go and be amazed by it all. As a matter of fact, I'd been wanting to do it for so long um, and had become a bit of a nut about, you know, researching it and watching every documentary that ever was and reading all the books. And, and uh, so I See, knew. I didn't know any of this. I didn't know. I had no idea you were this interested. Oh, in yeah. yeah. Uh, honestly, I didn't. I knew, I knew everything there was to know uh, that I could know, you know, from the, the, the documentaries and the books that I had read. And, and uh, uh, as I'm walking up and I'm doing the day I'm going to make it to base camp, my lungs were just on fire and I was really hurting. And I was by myself on the trail. And uh, um, I was really starting to think, fuck, I I'm hurting here. I might need to turn around and go rest a couple of days and, and try this again because, I, you know, I I'm just not feeling good. And just about the time I'm thinking, fuck, it might be time to turn around, that's when that avalanche snapped off. So that avalanche comes rumbling down the hill, and, and uh, now I'm invigorated because, holy shit, this really exciting thing just happened. So now my head's up a little bit more instead of staring down at these rocks because it's right. like trying to get across right. the moon. And about right. five minutes into this with a little bit more energy, because I'm now looking up and around a little bit, I happen to look over my right shoulder, and it dawns on me that that dark fucking speck of rock that's way up there is the fucking peak of Everest. And I burst Jeez. into tears. Yeah, I remember you saying that. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I that the way you would, I mean, in hearing it again, I I get used to. I'm thinking about it. I I can't imagine because you I, you said in the last podcast or that with, you talked about it. It's it's not like a picture, it, and you can't, you just can't. Yeah describe it no no, no. there's it's there's huge. no way to put into words the scope of that place dude i mean i made it at, the highest i made it was about nineteen thousand feet and everything around me was still up that's well this is small compared but that's how i mean when i was at allison and nick's wedding i you know i i had been to yosemite but only on horseback and i'd only gone on pack trips and sure. i'd always been around or behind and mostly it was in king's canyon and i had never really been in yosemite park proper and so God, it was so freaking funny. I got lost with a beer between my legs going, you know, that you have to do the loop through, through. Yeah. And I'm going around in circles and I'm trying to freaking find the wedding and I'm late. And I know they're going to start without me. I got a beer between my lap. 
driving around and finally I missed the turn off again. So I finally decide, screw it, I'm going to go the wrong direction right in front of a park ranger who turns on his lights, opens up his door. And I'm thinking I got a cooler full of beer in the back of my car, one in my lap. I'm arrested. Hey. And I leaned out the window and I just yelled, I'm late for a wedding. And I yelled where it was. And he said, follow me. And I remember thinking, awesome. You're the luckiest son awesome. of a bitch in the world. Now I, for, get, for... I jump out of my truck. I run up just in time to hug Allison. And, and, and then I looked up and went, you got it. That's what you guys were talking about. Yeah. It was incredible. Incredible. Now, for those that don't know, you're talking about uh, Nick and Allison Martinez when they got married, and they got married in the valley, in Yosemite Valley, basically right. under uh, El Capitan. Um, I Which think they had just climbed, yeah, what, a month or two before. Yeah, well, actually, and they did it again. Didn't they do it for their their honeymoon? I thought they. Did I don't it. know. I thought they did it for I their thought, honeymoon. I because I remember, hearing... that, well, I I know they did it once, and Nick told me that if 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 he can put up with her for the the whole trip up, and then she kind of told me privately if I could put up with him the whole time up, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll get married. Oh yeah, no, that was... you know they had talked about getting married for like a year, and then and then they were going to do that climb, and I remember Nick trying to impress upon her that it's going to be a big deal. And she, because you know Allison, she's kick-ass, right? Yeah. So you know she she wasn't sloughing it off as it was going to be easy. She was just thinking, you know, he knows what he's doing, mm. and I'm not, a, you know, I'm no I'm, I'm no slouch, and I taught him how to base jump, so I'll be fine. I remember, and uh, uh, I remember Nick the stories. T- that, oh, dude. the stories they told. I mean, some of the stories, like Nick shitting his pants halfway up, and then Allison having to put up with it, and then the, just some of the stories they told about the fights they would get into, and then she would realize that she has nowhere to go. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's no there's no stomping off. Well, think- They've got to deal with it right now, right then. And and she said it was the most amazing experience of her life. And then to get to the top and jump off was must have been amazing. Oh yeah, well one of the funny comments that she had made to me was something along the lines of you uh, you really don't know someone until you've watched them shit off the edge of a portal edge. <laughs> <laughs> And she's well. The way she told to me was, and then you realize you can't hold it anymore, yep. and now it's your and time. Now it's you, now to you gotta shit up. And then the Nick makes a fucking video of it. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever seen the video. But she doesn't realize that he's trying to video or trying to sneak a video of her taking a crap, and she gets furious. There's some videos that they brought back to watch the double wide. I don't uh, know if anybody else got to see. But it was funny, and they would get in these little little micro fights, and it, yeah, it was it was classic. You, I miss her. You should watch a uh, um, a documentary called Valley Uprising, and it's all about the climbing revolution that happened in Yosemite, and you'll love it because Ammon McNeely is in it. Uh, Evo, well, they got they got me into that as soon as they did that. I started doing that El Cap report. I don't know if you've ever seen that. Oh yeah, of course. It's a guy, yeah. So I started watching that, and and it, I would you know you could search that page and look up Nick and Allison, and and they would talk about them like they were regular. Oh, of course. Well, and, and, uh, and then you could go back because it's all there. So you can go back as far as you want and find Ammon. Oh, yeah. And see the, well, the, Ammon the, and, and uh, you'll see in the same uh, in the same uh, uh, documentary, <clears throat> Dean Potter's in there. Ivo Ninov is in there. You know, so and these are all the guys that came to us at Skydance uh, that were, hey, right. we're rock climbers and we want to learn how to skydive so we can base jump. And none of us no, realized you, that they weren't just rock you, climbers. They were fucking rock climbers. Yeah. Well, well, what was weird was we had no idea they were rock climbers. They introduced themselves. I remember there was more than just, you said there were three or four. I remember more like 12. There was a crew that showed up over the course of two nights. Yeah, but only, uh, only. Uh, I think there was five or six. There were five that, or six, that, that, that but only four of them ended up uh, getting through the course and graduating. Getting through, but yeah. they all started. Because two started. guys did the- Two guys did two jumps and said no, mm. but they still were talking about base jumping after a few beers. Yeah. But they were not gonna, they were not gonna skydive yeah. because to them that was it was it was a waste of money, waste of time, and they didn't want to do it. I remember I had to I had to actually I only did two AFFs with Nick, and on the second one we had to let go of them, and uh, it was weird because I I remember I think I, I think I was main side for whatever reason. Perry was on the other, and I signaled to let go, and Perry let go a little bit late. Nick. I don't know if he was going to try to do a backflip to be funny or if he whatever, but he, but I anticipated what what was about to happen because he he kind of went vertical for a second and dropped. Perry goes straight up in the air, so I go down after Nick. He's on his back, looking up at me, smiling. Yep, yep. And I just remember thinking, you you, I should just stamp you right now. You love this. Oh, He's yeah. on his back. Flips over on his stomach, flips back on his back, and I'm like, "This is your second jump, or this is asinine. This oh, yeah. guy is so comfortable. Well, his first so relaxed. God, his first goddamn jump, it was me and Kim, and he threw Kim out the door, uh, threw me about ten seconds later, and I spent the entire skydive grabbing the beach ball, trying to look over my shoulder, pointing vigorously." <laughs> 
with oh, him, I think our, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, feather. with him fucking 300 feet above me, because there's no way in hell I'm getting back up to this skinny guy. Um, I and, never jumped him after that. Oh yeah, I couldn't. I could. I got nothing. I could wear would make me float. Oh like no, I would have had to have a fucking camera wings on. And he, but he pulled, yeah. and it was funny because when we landed, he was really upset uh, that he didn't think he had done well on the jump. And I'm like, man, you pulled. I will jump with you seven days a week. <laughs> you pulled your parachute, man. We can fix everything else. Everything else. Yeah, I remember Ammon loved it. He loved it. Uh, what surprised me about it was because I remember we were all talking about them base jumping, and they were talking about them being climbers, and and uh, I don't remember. Uh, I don't remember not not thinking that they were professional climbers. I just remember thinking you look like it, you act like it, you, you, and then you know the car is full of climbing gear, oh, so yeah. they must be climbers. I just didn't think it was that big of a deal like skydiving. And so then all of a sudden, um, Perry walks over and overhears the conversation about base jumping, and he pulls them all aside and says, "You're not skydiving, you know, Perry." Yeah. I mean, so he pulls them all aside and, and gets them huddled up. We've all been drinking beers and stuff, and he gets them into this cuddle and he says. You can only AFF here and go through the course if you're going to take it seriously, because we're not going to teach you how to base jump. We're going to teach you how to skydive first. And I, they had already been given that advice, so they're all right. kind of smiling because someone had already told them if you're going to do this, you got to do it properly, right. and you got to do your two jumps and all that kind of stuff. So Perry was all proud of himself and boasting that I talked him into <laughs> getting the skydive. And I'm like, well, you, I think you reinforced it. Yeah, man. Got oh, that was. Perry. That was some fun stuff. That was some really fun stuff. But then to to find out, of course, through research shortly after that, that that these guys are are the fucking stone monkeys, and and uh, uh, that they and and other people that have gone through that little brethren are like world famous fucking climbers. Ammon McNeely, yeah. for Christ's sakes, is the pirate, who unfortunately the, the, for him now is famous for ripping his foot off on a base jump. Oh, and video in it. Yeah, there's a picture of you and I in, in the uh, in the otter, and he's out in a wingsuit. Yep, yep. And I'm that's, tagged. I, that's I'm in tagged in the photo. Yeah, I'm I'm tagged in the photo off to the side. So if you hover over him, it says Anna McNeely. Hover over the plane right around the cockpit, it says Dean Ritchie. And if you hover over to the wing, it says Jim Matthews. Nice. But everyone for some reason thinks I'm the idiot in the wingsuit. <laughs> no man. And I'm was... and, and I have to tell him, first of all, that would have been my last and only skydive. Right. If I had to look at the terrain below, I would have been, <laughs> what was the guy that, that disappeared with all the money? I would have been that guy that they never found. <laughs> DB there Cooper. Was, there were, I would, yeah, I would have been the Jim Matthews is out there somewhere. There's a spot. <laughs> I don't know where he landed. I have no idea how he got out and made where he was supposed to go, but that was an incredible picture. Yeah. But Zach well, took- yeah. Zach took, well, in that same trip, uh, um, we flew over Yosemite. As a matter of fact, you remember that? Yep, yep. We got to go right over the top of Yosemite. We were doing steep turns over Half Dome, which, of course, was ridiculously illegal, but it was cool. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of... I just remember... I- I remember watching him float away and just thinking, oh, man, he must know exactly, you know, and he knew that he knew that whole area so well. And I'm sure but oh, I just yeah. remember thinking I hadn't really given this any thought. Where is he going to freaking live? <laughs> yeah. Uh, the so. pirate maniac. So um, wh- what what is the story I hear about? You had uh, a toothpick shoved in your dick. Oh Christ! Did we have to go like start right away? Yeah, no, no, no. We just talked. We just spent uh, twenty five minutes talking about Everest and mellow shit and climbers and stuff. I want to hear how toothpicks ended up in your fucking dick. Okay, so this is. <laughs> I didn't even get to... okay. I'll... Okay, just so everyone out there knows, I have a list, and some of them are a bunch of comments about Dean, but one of them says, "J Crew." I call bullshit on the uh, burnt scrotum. You spent most of your time showing everybody at the uh, bar how many toothpicks you could put in. <laughs> All right, so so you're gonna want to clarify. <laughs> you spent. So are we are we talking the Skydance bar or are we talking the the fucking bar in the town? <laughs> the bar. What, what was the one at the at the end of the street? Um, you're talking about the one in town. That was, uh, I can't I don't know. We're not, never did, never did it in town. You, the conversation usually started with somebody showing them your, your grill marks. And the next thing you know, we're putting olives and toothpicks and we made little barbells and, and it was, uh, God, what was the, it, it, Plainfield. Plain, really? You were shoving toothpicks in your dick in Plainfield. So I show up and there's a whole, there's a whole table of people trying to pick this lock, right? They're all going to go make a base jump off of some tower somewhere. And somebody had, had went out there, could not, they finally had put a lock, I guess, on the lift that goes up it. Right. So they've got a lock pick set and they're all sitting around trying to pick the lock. And 
I did a couple shots, had a couple beers, and was getting kind of, and I walked over and I said, let me try it. And I put the pick in and click, click, boom, and opened up. Okay. And they're like, wait, well, they had been messing with it for like forever. Right. And so that that get me that got me kind of confident. And now they're like, sit down and show us how you did that. And they did it again. And I don't remember how or why I did it, but I was looking at the pick, the the, the pick set, and I said something asinine like, I can pick all kinds of things. Like I got this and trick that I can. And then the next thing you know, I dropped trow and I took the pick and stuffed it in. <laughs> You're gonna want to be really specific here. <laughs> okay. So okay, so because all right, so I, is that, what is it? Is it a Prince Henry? God, my kids are gonna listen to this. This is there's no video of this. Thank God. Like, this could all I could be making all this up, people. So is it? It's not a Prince Henry. What do you call it? The it's a it's where it goes through the force. Oh, Prince Albert. Well, Prince Albert is the one where it goes from behind the head of a, a penis and out the tip. That's a Prince Albert. It's not that. Okay. So there must be a Prince Henry. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, you're so, gonna start off with me. So, is there gonna be a picture now on your web page going it's from just, it's just base gonna, camp to toothpicks? Yeah, it's just gonna be a dick with a toothpick in it. Anyway, so so the first time I the first time I consciously remember doing this was that lockpick incident. Wait, 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 how did you end up with the extra hole in your dick? Okay, that was pre skydiving. So these antics in my life did not start with skydiving. That came with me. I did not discover my ability to be a jackass at the drop zone. So, so you got a piercing. So I got a piercing because I, I lost a bet with a buddy. I don't remember if it was how many push-ups I could do. <laughs> I don't remember if it was how many push-ups I could do or run up and down the street and get a, my, a good, good friend of mine. Love him like a brother. Great guy. You guys would love him. He came to drop zone a couple of times. There was no way he was ever going to make a skydive. All right, so we we do this. We had this thing where we would get drunk and wrestle. We'd get drunk and we'd bet. And I don't remember what we were doing, but we had mouse traps. We were snapping mouse traps on our fingers and our ears and our nose. And then, of course, it comes up that okay, if you lose the bet, you got to snap a mouse trap on your Ooh. Mr. Ha- Mr. Happy. And that to me sounded a little much. I mean, that was my threshold. I don't yeah. know. I, and then I, you know, the, the, what's that Peroni's disease? I'm thinking I'm going to end up with a, an injury and I'm going to have to, there's a lot of you know, things I've gone into the hospital for, and it's usually not that. So long story short, the, the bet was if you lose, uh, you have to click an alligator clip on Mr. Happy for a certain period of time. All right. All right. What, I, what I didn't, okay, now we're in a garage. It's full of tools. He's a, he's a, he's a Ford mechanic full of tools. And so I don't, he knows he's going to win this bet. So I go in the kitchen, do a couple of vodka shots. I'm hanging out with his wife. We're talking about this bet and he takes an alligator clip and sharpens it. So where it's got the tip of it's got a, I mean, he takes a little file and makes it sharp. So I'm thinking it's just a regular, you know, two ends of an alligator clip for like electrical, sure. you know, testing. I lose the bet. He picks a spot. I pull out the foreskin and he snaps it on instant piercing. Wow. No alcohol, no, no anything. And and then he's counting off the time and I'm watching the blood drip thinking that's going to leave a mark. Jesus Christ. And it, so it never healed. So then You're... for the longest time I was embarrassed. And then finally I was dating this girl named, oh, I love you, Jeannie. I was dating this girl named Jeannie up in Seattle and I couldn't take it anymore. We walked by a piercing shop and she said, have you ever thought about getting a tattoo or piercing? They said, actually. So... <laughs> For the longest time in my bathroom at the double white, I had this big ring, you know, that has the tube, a little, it's not yeah. a straight bar. It's like a bent round bar. Right. And it's got the deals on there. And everybody will ask me, why is that hanging on your, uh, your medicine cat? And I'm like, it's just a little reminder of how asinine life can get. Oh, Jesus. It's, it's the stories like that that you tell that only bring to mind, um, the character from the movie. I can't remember the name of the movie, but the character was Frank the Tank. Oh, God. <laughs> I don't know if I'm Frank the Tank, and in some of the comments we got after our last podcast, I got called a lot of things, but not Frank the Tank. Speaking of, but yeah, that what they were calling was, you, they want to know, and you're going to have so going to go there too. Yeah, I'm going to nail you on what, all this shit. Hey, listen, what are the boundaries here? Are we there just are no go fucking broke? boundaries. Are you kidding me? I've got all the buttons on my side. You're on the other end of Skype. You have nothing. That's it. I've got them all. Can I see some of the comments about you? Or you? you can, totally. Yeah, absolutely. I'm fair game. Everybody knows everything about me. <laughs> okay. Well, first of all, I, what, I have to say, the funniest comment that I got, where is it on here? Camera flyer, yes. 
<laughs> Belly jump? No. Uh, I don't know how you got through AFF. Uh, yeah, you did pass first, but it was by accident. Um, where's the one that says, oh, yeah, camera flyer, awesome. Everything else, garbage. Take off that magic helmet of yours, and you're an absolute danger to everybody and yourself in the air, especially in that asinine red and white suit that makes you stand out like a freaking ass. Tell them the seventh jump or eighth jump story at either Elsinore or Paris, and that you crapped your pants, yeah. Oh, Jesus. So, so there's about four stories in that sentence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so how did you fall into the red and white, red, white, and black suit? I mean, was that like a team colors, or those were just your colors? No, 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 I, I think I mentioned that in the last podcast. So, so. Oh, that's right. Know, to my, cover up the blood. I'd broken my leg. No, no, no. I'd broken my leg, and then um, I, I walked around in a boot. I did, the, I did my packing course in a boot, and I had a pick line in my arm because I'd been in the hospital for three months. Yep. Almost lost my leg because I yep. got compartment syndrome. Yep. And. Uh, did the packing course and I just hung around the drop zone like an idiot. I think one time I, I hooked up an IV bag in my car cause I had to take antibiotics. And then I caught Milan in the parking lot talking to Annette, which I had a huge crush on. And, uh, so he said, you want to make a skydive? And I, I said, I gotta, I can't really take this boot off. And so we busted one of those, uh, surveyor sticks and two taped it to my leg, but it was, you know, we basically made a duct tape boot out of these two pieces of wood. Right. And then we had we had to cover that up to get into to the gear room to put on uh, uh, a student suit because that this was going to be jump thirteen so it was going to be one a recurrency and two I got I got to get in there without everyone noticing that I've, I'm wearing this sort of a because the boot was huge it was almost like a fixator but nothing went through the skin into the right. bones right and uh, so I don't remember if it was him or someone ran into Action Air and they had this huge pair of red and white. It was like red panel on one side, white on the other, and then red and white on the back. Right. And uh, so, yeah, he comes running out of, of uh, Action Air with those. I put it on over over my uh, – oh, I took my boot. pants off in the parking lot, put it over that, that duct tape wooden boot. And that and was the colors. We, yeah, and I, for, I forego the uh, student jumpsuit. He ran back. I think I, I, think I, bought, I think I walked back in there with those on and bought a topper, and that was the two-piece that I wore all through AFF. And yeah, fair enough. So I got to my – Fair enough. See. Fair enough. Now, so was, that was so a- after that, everything had to be red and white. So I, so that's why all the pictures I'm red on one side, white on the other. Right. And then Ryan designed my camera helmet, which used to get a lot of comments. Ryan, because I would just call Ryan and say, "I want a camera helmet," and he'd say, oh, "Okay, you need a flat top." So I'll get you a flat top. And then it, so it had red flames down one side and white flames down the other, and it just it, it just had an interesting look. It was sure. simple but really clean, really cool. Yeah, yeah for sure, for sure. All right, so you dodged uh, very effectively, by the way. <laughs> The J Crew. I'm good at that. I was trying. Yeah, and it's not going to fucking happen, dude. Uh, the J Crew <laughs> explanation. So I know people are are saying you're full of shit for not uh, copping to why your nickname is J Crew. Okay, so the the when we formed Kaleidoscope, it was Colin Bruce. It was his idea. I guess he'd had Kaleidoscope as a as a team in England. Colin of the of the Clan Bruce. And he put a team together. And I told you the story before of how I made the team. I I jumped 176, put Dawson's camera on my head, and paid my own way, and boom, I'm the team member. Right. So everybody, we were all coming up with nicknames for everybody. And uh, I don't know how or why, but there was a girl at the drop zone I was seeing at the time. And um, she had told them, I think, because I, I remember doing like a, at this point, I think I did, I had a coach rating. So it must have been past 200 jumps. It was late in the summer. And I had done a coach jump and I came back and they're all dying laughing. <laughs> and they're saying, well, that's, that's his nickname, J crew. And I remember thinking, Oh my God, no, 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 no. That can't be my nickname. So I'm in a hotel room in, I don't know. I go to Rockwell training. This is before sky. Remember I told you a story about how I got into sky. It was yeah. on one of these Rockwell yeah. conferences. Well, leading up to that, I did a whole bunch of training I'm in a hotel room. I'm dating a girl. She wants to have phone sex. I'm not very good at phone sex. And so she's like, well, there's got to be lotion in the in the bathroom, right? I mean, so and I, I'm like, yeah, but I've done that before. It's kind of stingy. And, and then uh, and I was got to go. And she goes, well, do you have any hair gel? I'm like, well, yeah, I've got some J. Crew. <laughs> and it worked great. I mean, come on, right? You put a little in your hair, you know, you kind of, and you're looking good. You got a little left on your hands. Oh, Burr. man. Burr. So you're, you're, Anyways, you're so I spent the two weeks, at, I think it was Wisconsin. I spent the two weeks having phone sex with Jay Crew as my lube with this girl. I won't, oh. I won't name because she, I don't know if she even talks to me anymore. Awesome. And now I, the only guy that I ever took on a skydive 
who who was my uh, did, a, did a tan that I actually grew up with uh, knows her well. So, anyways, yeah. So she so that so that was the story, and and then she was at the drop zone telling them that story. Oh, that's and awesome. so for the longest time, but it, but it was funny because for some reason, Prof, the youngest guy on our team, Matt Stevens, hadn't heard the story, so he ends up buying or somebody bought me J Crew uh, gel for a gift. And didn't and, and hadn't heard the story, and I thought, oh, okay, someone told you the story. And they're like, no, 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 everyone calls you J Crew. I figured you either wear the shirts or you use your, the hair gel. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, so I didn't know that. that. That's a fantastic story. Well, now you got a fair amount of notes from our last podcast. Um, what what else have people? What else did people say? Because there were I got a lot of funny stuff that came through from that podcast. But I know you did too, and I hadn't heard it until we just talked before the show. Okay. Well, one of the first, one of one of the the funniest comments I got was how relaxed and how fun Ray was on the podcast. Ray so, Farrell, yeah, yeah. Ray Farrell, Ray Farrell, and Scott Meeker had a very tenuous relationship, and there was an event that that happened at Ray's house at a Christmas party that we can track back about five years prior to when it started. Right. So Scott Meeker's a re- Scott Meeker's a wrestler, right? Okay, so we're standing around. I don't know Meeker very well. I've just met Team Jank. We're all standing in the double wide, and Meeker's telling somebody that he used to be a, like all state, you know, world wrestler, or whatever. And I said, yeah, my younger brother. He actually was a step brother. He was, you know, only like eight months or whatever younger. I, I, he was all state, but I there's one move that I get him every time, and he's you know he's a little bit shorter than me. And Meeker's like, there's no move I don't know. And I said, yeah, but this is this is a move that I kind of came up with on my own, and it's it's infallible. You can't get out of it, and and I I, I hate to do it to you in front of your friends. And of course, Meeker's looking at me like, you fuck, I will, I will, I'm gonna, I'm, you, you think you're gonna embarrass me? So this goes on back and forth a little while, and then then Meeker and I developed the stare, and this goes on for years. Meeker and I could be could be across the room. I don't know. There's a movie where there's these two brothers that look at each other. Oh, no, no, no. It's that one in Vegas where they're, they're all supposed to go kill some guy. And, and, and there's these two brothers that look at each other. They're hitmen. Hmm. And every time they look at each other, they just start brawling. <laughs> it was like, it's got – anyways, it's a bunch of different hitmen crews that have got to go shoot some guy in the top of the Vegas, whatever. Anyways, so Meeker and I would ha- develop this thing. So anyways, the, the trick is you gotta, you got to get Meeker drunk <laughs> and you got to give him this look. Like, you know, I know I could kick your ass. And he looks at you and he looks at you and then he finally puts his drink down. You put your drink down and then we just go at each other. But this time it started a little bit differently. The very first time it started with, you, there's no way you, you cannot, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm all state. I'm like, yeah, I've never wrestled, but I mean this, I'll have you pinned pretty quickly and then I'll leave you like that. It's going to be embarrassing. So anyways, long story short, he says, how do you want to start? And I'm like, I don't know anything about wrestling, but I'm going to win. So I just, just, let's just get this over with. So he kind of says, okay, well, we'll grapple a little bit. And I, as soon as I, I notice he's not quite paying attention, I grab his leg and we are on the ground and he's starting to put elbows and twist underneath my arm. And before he can do anything that's going to hurt me, I reach back, grab his underwear and pull him as hard as I freaking can. With that, his body goes limp. I mean, just absolutely. Cause he's not expecting to get a full fucking wedgie, right? His body goes limp. You reach back, you grab a foot bend the foot back up to his ass and snap the underwear over his foot. <laughs> it's called a covered wagon. And he bursts into tears laughing. But you know when you're laughing so hard you can't even make sound? Yeah. And then everyone in the room's laughing. Then you grab the other foot and you put it in too. And now they're helpless because they can't reach back and they can't get the underwear off. Meeker's is, I mean, Meeker's a pretty serious guy to get oh, yeah. him to laugh. Oh, yeah. So, you know, and then he struggles around until his underwear freaking ripped because that there's a lot of quite a bit of tension there. So that became the covered wagon. And, and, and I thought I'm dead. So I immediately grabbed some booze and I'm standing about 15 or 20 feet out in front of the double wide deciding which way to run. Because as soon as he gets his underwear off, he's going to not just wrestle me. I'm getting punched. Yeah. I know he's going to kill me. Oh, yeah. And he thought it was a, he thought it was the funniest damn thing in the world. Oh. When I go back in the double wide about five minutes later, there's someone on the couch with a covered wagon. There's someone over in the corner with a covered <laughs> wagon. Everyone's <laughs> pulling their underwear up over. Show me how to do it. So this kind this kind of became a thing where we're all drinking, and all of a sudden Meeker and I would catch eyes. We did it at one of Ray's Christmas parties, right in front of everybody. He was awesome. standing over by the Christmas tree. I was in the kitchen. He gave me the look. I looked at him. He set his drink down and we just started running at each other because then it became 
who could get whose underwear first. And I was always wearing boxers, dipshit. So he, didn't, he would pull up and nothing would really happen. And then boom, before he could realize he's pulling on big baggy boxers, I've got his tighty whities up over his foot and boom, and you snap. And, you, and then you stand up like you're a rope, you know, like, like, like an a rodeo. rodeo. <laughs> This goes on until Scott's on double tough secret probation. He's not allowed to come to the drop zone unless asked. I mean, I, and I don't know what the riff was between him and Ray, but it had started because of team stuff and everything else. Sure. And so he ends up at the Christmas party. I think at the time he may have been on again, off again, dating Tui. Okay. Ray got a little, Ray got a little tuned up more than usual. Love you, Ray. He tuned up, and he was pretty happy about that Christmas. And I think that might have been the year where the pack finally made it across the ocean, and everybody was okay. And sure. he got to do some flybys and everything else. So he's tuned up. He's got his Santa hat on. And Mika looks at me. I'm over by the Christmas tree this time. And then he looks over at Ray. <laughs> now, Mika is on the edge of being asked never to come back to Davis. And I, again, I don't know what the riff was, but there right. was some riff between him and Ray. Right. I think he's either thinking I'm going to go out with a bang right. or I'm going to see how far I can take this with Ray. Sure. So he looked at Ray and I looked at him kind of concerned. Are you are are you suggesting that we <laughs> cover Wagon Ray? You know, because he's kind ah. of dressed up for Christmas. Now, there's a picture of Ray handing me a gift somewhere on the Internet. All right. It's after that. You can see him in the Santa hat, and Ray's got a little glow. I got a little glow. Meeker's <laughs> in the background with kind of a shitty grin on his face, so I don't know. Maybe he thought of this before. So I go over to him to kind of ask how this is going to work, and before I do, he's got Ray pushed off to the side, kind of going over on his side. Ray immediately goes into – wrestle or is he fighting me or what's going on because of this tension all right i reached i reached over the back of meeker he missed the underwear i sorry ray it wasn't meeker <laughs> it was me i reached up pulled the underwear up and i thought you've gone this far take it as far as you can and i grabbed his foot and put it in he <laughs> reached over grabbed the other foot snap and then raised belly down on the couch in his living room and for and there's there's a there's a pause a notable pause in the kitchen Remember Dan, the pilot, everyone's just paused oh, for a yeah. second, like Ray's belly down on his couch with a huge grin on his face. But he, <laughs> you remember I told you the part about you can't laugh because it's so stunning what's sure. going on to you right now sure. that you're just exhaling. So Ray's grinning, but no one can tell if he's about to kick everybody out or what's going on. And then all of a sudden he bursts into laughter and then all the camera flashes start going off. Oh, of course. And then Meeker and I just quietly, Meeker and I quietly walk off out into the backyard area. And I said to Meeker, I hope he's madder at you because of your shit that you got going on that I don't know about than me, but I'm pretty much getting used to thinking about moving out of the drop zone. Oh. And and apparently someone unclicked him, let him up, and he thought it was the funniest goddamn thing in the world until he found out there was pictures. And then the next day, there was a, a more torn out. I mean, it, there was an unwritten memo that went around. <laughs> if that picture is on the student room or in the hangar or on the wall leading in someone's ass is gone yeah for sure i mean come on at the end of the day ray was always a, a teddy bear always a teddy bear with a huge bark and not much of a bite and that was very much by design with him you know i mean he knew damn well how well, he, he, he 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 knew how he wanted things done and he barked real fucking loud and and uh he most of the time he was right <laughs> most of the time not all the time well, and, I, and the reason why I always say that I, I thought I was going to get kicked out of the double wide was because, you know, it, it was my fluke that we even got to move in. Mm -hmm. I mean, he had, he was done with letting people stay at the double wide. Him and Dan, you know, DOB had had, had uh, figured out that that was where they wanted. I think that's where they both lived together until they got married, mm -hmm. or at least Ray did. And uh, so he'd had four or five people in there, couples, everybody else, and there was just, he was tired of it. And so he, he had the carpets clean. He wasn't sure what he was going to do with it. And then Ryan Arnold, I think he, he had transitioned from Manifest over into uh, into sales and actionaire. Yeah. And he came up with the idea, I bet if I got Matthews, because he's got money, and could, I bet Matthews would be responsible enough to convince Ray, and, and I could just live down the street instead of having to commute to work every day. So Ryan was doing it more selfishly. All of a sudden, Ryan's my best friend. He's kicking my ass at Manifest every day, and now he's like, hey. Hey, what's up? You want to make a skydive? Let's talk over here. I just love so that you were. I love that you were the responsible we come up, one. 
Oh, yeah. So we come up with a plan. Yeah, right. And Ryan has no idea because he, I, is, at this point, Ryan only knows I'm a jackass that cannot cannot figure out how to manifest with, you know, with my shit on and ready to go. And, right. and actually with any etiquette that drops on, I'm just right. a moron that keeps just to get on an airplane, not ready. So Ryan hatched the idea. But then we had to sell it to Ray, who'd already made up his mind that he was going to either turn it into an office or maybe he was going to move his office down there. He hadn't decided, but whatever he was going to do, no one was living there. He was right. done with it. And then we turned it into probably the best stretch. I mean, oh, there was yeah. one year we one year we had. I think it may have been the first year, or maybe the second. Ryan, you'll have to correct me if I'm wrong, but we put out a. I think Billy had brought over steaks one night to kind of break the place in, and we hatched this idea that we'd do a New Year's Eve party. Mm. And the word got out. And I remember Ray coming in almost an hour or two before New Year's Eve. It took him that long to get through the parking lot from where he had to park, <laughs> walking through the crowd of people to get into the kitchen to get a drink and say, don't ever do this again. Right, right. Speaking I mean, of. It was a literal, it was a rave. I mean, the place was huge. There was people that said that they had seen the double wide from a distance, but never got in. Wow. Speaking of, by the way, happy, like I, happy 2020. Yeah. It's I mean, fucking I'm 2020, dude. It's 2020. Is that not? That's bizarre. I started the day thinking about 2020, but every time I do one of these podcasts, I'm going to get all my crap out tonight, spread it all out over the ground, organize all my camera gear, get out my parachute and plan my next skydive and then get pissed off and put it all away. It's fucking 20. Dude, it's 2020. We're old. We're talking. We're sitting here reminiscing about the good old days. We're old. But we're similar in age. I don't think I'm like three years older than you. But yeah. we're we're similar enough to remember 1990 being a big year, 1999 go, being a big yeah. year, 2000 being the world's going to end, and then, no, it never did. 2010, yeah. I don't remember it being that big of a deal, but 2020, dude, that's kind of a trip. It's a trip, isn't it? Now, that being said, I did it in official old fashion. I fucking watched the fireworks and went to bed. <laughs> I did the same thing. Yeah, yeah, it's no. like I drink and I don't. Right. Uh, some of the antics have went away. I still have the mental antics. I and and I, I my daughter and I have a hilarious relationship, so we bounce ideas off of each other all the time. But we never actually do any of the stuff we talk about. Well, I do the same with mine as well. Um, yeah, I, I'm 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 yeah. almost. I'm, I, so tell, I, go ahead, go ahead. Elaborate a little bit of that. So you mentioned you've mentioned it a couple of times. She's in med school, or no? She's going to be an attorney. She's going to be an attorney. Yeah, she's uh, she's twenty two years old now. She just got through her first year of law school. Uh, she graduated uh, with her her uh, uh, bachelor's uh, magna cum laude, uh, and now she's wow. her first year of law school, having done quite well her first uh, her first year. And getting ready to go into the second one, working steady boyfriend since like the f- sophomore year of high school. It's ridiculous. She's every responsible bone that I didn't get, she got. Well, and, but here's the thing, and, and not to get too serious, but here's the thing Jack grew, grows up, and my son, Jack, grows up in a drop zone, and he's a scuba diver. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he, he's, I think he's, he's coming up on something like his 1300 or 1400 scuba. Yeah. He trains crowds up to 12 on light dives. He can take one or two up to a certain depth, and then he can take one guy to sure. very low depths. He works, it works out in Monterey. Um, he partied at Riverside for three years. He was a bio, uh, biochem major. And then the last year, he, he buckled down to pass everything. Then showed up at Monterey and they said, you got to be kidding me with this GPA and and uh, there's no way we're going to give you a job. And he was the only one that was willing to stick out, you know, all of the all do the link uh, the sure. dissections. I'm the one. That, and so everyone else would show up for three weeks or two weeks or less to do their job. And Jack was always there. So he got to do all that stuff and he got to know the entire community of Carmel and Monterey. And wow. and. and I could I could tell when he when he bought all his scuba gear and how much time he spent at the scuba shop that was what he wanted to do. Sure, because I could just see his version of skydiving for you. Right, but he he had this science background from school, and it was amazing that he could party that hard for three years, almost get kicked out, and then just smoke the entire biochem major. I sat him down. He's still pissed at me today. I sat him down and said, "Look, I don't think you want to do this. Maybe your mom and I pushed you too hard, and you're thinking that." We want this for you. And he's like, no, this isn't a major. I'm like, no one takes biochem, dude. Nobody. <laughs> and uh, he ends up getting straight A's and B's and, and takes, you know, twice as many units as anybody else. Sure. And then decides he wants a scuba. Yeah. Can you imagine if I was a scuba dive? Oh, I you would have fucking drowned years ago, dude. 
<laughs> yeah, that's what, and he's like, oh, dad, it's not that tough. I'm like, look, in skydiving, you only got a couple things you got to do, and I'm just shitty at landing a lot. Yeah, yeah. Can you imagine me? I would drown at 15 feet. If I'd, if I'd have done what I did on jump 12, I'd have been dead on jump or on dive. I, I'd have died in the damn pool. Well, if, you're, if your scuba diving career mirrored your skydiving career, you would have been you would have had <laughs> limbs missing from fucking being bitten by sharks and barracuda. You would have been stung by fucking jellyfish. You would have spent a, a fair amount of your life in a hyperbaric chamber recovering from the bends and oh, then yeah. you'd fucking drown. and then you'd have to, no, you know, I'd, i would have i would have had to buy a double wide next to <laughs> a scuba center in a warm water area with my own yeah with my own uh, oh, yeah. Deep, what do you call it the, yeah the, my own tank yeah yeah no your your uh your scuba diving career would end up with you floating on a dinghy sticking your face oh, in the water <laughs> and that and that's just it so so i spent all this time with jack trying to tell him do what you want to do do what you want to you know that would do what you love you're obviously as smart as your daughter and you're doing exactly what you want to love that's what a lot of i mean a lot of the comments are dean's a mystery since you talked about me putting toothpicks in my in my dick, <laughs> everyone wants to know, do you rent your girlfriends? There's no way that guy, okay, yes, he's good looking, but there's no way that guy, just with his sense of humor alone, can meet women like that. I'm talking about the ones that he actually dated for longer than six weeks or got off my lap in a tandem. For... So, and I'm not going to tell you who wrote that. Oh, you have to tell me so, who wrote that. Give me the first name. Nope. Nope. And so, because it says anonymous, and then it says, fuck you if you tell Dean. Fuck, what the fuck? What the fuck? <laughs> Anyways, because I'm not going to tell you. But, so you've had what? How many serious relationships? And l l let's define serious. Let's go for longer than three months. Um, no, fuck. That's not serious. Let's go for longer than a year. There longer... was one girl... <laughs> no, screw that. You have to go... With you, you got to go through. You lose... Is it? Do you lose interest? No, 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 no. So if you if we're going longer than a year, um, one, two, three, four, I've had four long term relationships. So you know love. <sighs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You've been loved. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What movie is that from? Wait, that's the movie where the guy catches AIDS. No, I just made I just made that up. I swear to God. No, I have no just... idea what that's from. Yeah, there's a I movie. Just, I just popped it. I just popped in my head. I just so you're you're, you're not a lonely man, Dean. No, be no, okay. no, no. I've actually now I've been in a long term relationship now for about a year and a half. Um, so that that would wow. be, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Oh, God, I didn't offend her. But um, I, I did. I'm not offending her, but 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 you have you have dated some, and I'm sure she's beautiful. But um, she is absolutely. No one really ever got to know anybody that you dated before because we well, only got to see her, you know. And then yeah. you guys would disappear. You 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 were you were you were a mid style, not mid style, a, a, a low time fire pit guy at Davis. You yeah. seemed to sneak away. Well, because you were very busy, you had a lot of numbers to call at the end of every day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I ghosted from the fire pit quite a lot. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't did hang out. No, did you have a notepad? Did you have a, like one thing strapped to your knee, and then you had one on the other side that was just numbers? And, and did think... you have a code you wrote next to each number? Like, just wanted to. This is like backup to the backup to the backup. I'll I call think... this one first just to piss off. I, I honestly, I think the only reason that you have this opinion of me is because the one time that I got the nurse's phone number from the cockpit when you were taking her on a tandem. No. <sighs> And I'm not even sure how that happened, but I remember she gave me her number just before you guys got hooked up to make the jump. Well, you even got the phone number. So I'm doing a tandem with – there's a really, really good-looking girl. You were you were kind of ticked off you had to fly or maybe you'd wash the – there was some reason you, were, you weren't – every now and again, you would get – it really, maybe somebody would make a mess in the pad. You were really protective of that plane. I mean, it was like it was your own. Oh, yeah. And uh, you were not in a good mood to fly. I don't remember what it was. Maybe it wasn't a full load or some reason. So you kind of romped off to the airplane. So with Dean wasn't in a good mood. So I remember Russell was doing, remember Russell that was the, the chef from San Francisco? I do, yeah. Russell's doing a wingsuit jumps. So he's got to get in there and you're like, oh, God, okay, fine. And you kind of move some stuff around and to push the oxygen tank back a little bit. I think I was doing an 18 grand uh, uh, skydiving, removed the oxygen tank, and you're kind of like, yeah, hey, yeah, fine, and you're not interacting with anybody. And then someone leans over in my ear and says, man, her daughter's gorgeous, but that's a hell of a MILF. 
you got sitting on your lap. Hmm. And I don't know. I didn't know what a milk was and I didn't quite hear what they said. Right. So I leaned over and I, I said, I couldn't, I couldn't under, what, what? And they said, that, that nice milk. And I looked at him frustrated and I'm playing with my oxygen. And I said, what's a milk? He said, what? And she's right there. <laughs> and I yelled, what's a milk? <laughs> you perked up. Whoop. All of a sudden, Dean's back. You turned around until you needed to see who's in my airplane. <laughs> I remember being everyone laughing and quite not knowing why I just made an ass of myself. And then all of a sudden you turned around like, I, I, hey, who's this? <laughs> Notepad opens up on your leg. Get your little chart out. <laughs> Pack's an easy airplane to fly. What can I say? You can pay attention to a lot of stuff flying a pack. You can. Yeah. You can. Well, that was the question I asked you earlier was how do you set a pack just right to have consensual I never, relations? I, I actually, I've never had consensual relations in a pack. Although flying the pack in Chicago once, um, the way that we would do it so that we could get more passengers in the pack is we would turn the co-pilot. I you were going to say the way that we would do it so we could take it to altitude. So, yeah, right. Go ahead. I'm sorry. It's okay. <laughs> we, we would turn the co-pilot seat around so that a tandem instructor could yeah, yeah, sit on that, that seat. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we did that for a while. Yeah. So we had a uh, had this girl that came out and she wanted to do ride-alongs in the airplane. She couldn't afford to jump, but she wanted to do ride-alongs. She's a real cute girl. That was a no, no, Davis. no, no, this was, it happened in Davis too, but this was in, this was in Chicago oh, okay. for sure. And so she does like three or four ride alongs and then we have a shutdown because there's not enough jumpers for another load. So we're waiting and I go back in and, and, uh, Lisa Dexter, who's working manifest at the time was like, dude, you can't just leave this girl on the plane. I know she's cute and all, but come on, she's got to pay for, for the flights if she's going to keep going. Oh, oh, oh. So I'm, I, I go to the girl and I'm like, you know, I'm afraid you're not going to be able to go on any more ride alongs. Although... Uh, we do let people, you know, do tandems for free if they jump naked. And she's like, and I was just said that jokingly and I wasn't even thinking anything. And she's all, well, can I just ride along if I'm naked? And my response oh, was, geez. well, I'm good with that, but let me check with manifest. And so I go back up and I ask Lisa, and I'm like, the chick wants to keep doing right. How many, wait, how, how many, how many flights have you done with her prior to this? this like three this or ask? four, like three or four. Oh, you're not that good. I don't believe it. I, I refuse to believe in three or four, four yeah, yeah, rides so, altitude. She wants to use here naked. Yeah, yeah. So three or four, Come on. three or four flights. And, 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 but I tell her she can't fly along anymore, but you know, and again, I jokingly say, but we give, you know, we give tandems for free. If you're naked, she doesn't want to jump, but she wants to keep flying in the plane. She's like, well, I'll fly naked. So I go to Lisa oh, and I'm like, Lisa, nice. she says, she's going to, you know, do the ride alongs naked. What do you think? And she's like, if that girl takes off her clothes and rides naked, she can go all day long. So <laughs> Lisa didn't even flinch. She's like, it's Dean. Yeah. So this girl, I shit you not in a bailout rig. Cause we had to, you know, with the pack, you have to wear a bailout rig if you're a co-pilot. So she yeah, strips, yeah. she yeah. strips down buck naked, lets me put on a bailout rig and spends the next five or six loads, I think riding naked in the co-pilot seat. And the funniest part what is, your- so you know how everybody rides in a pack. They all ride facing the yeah, tail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody sits facing right. the tail, right? Oh, except me in the very, very back. I'm always facing forward. Yeah. I can't see anything. But everybody, the majority of the time, they sit facing the tail of the airplane. Yeah. Not with a naked chick sitting in the co-pilot seat. They don't. (laughs) They all keep doing crunches all the way to fucking 13,000 feet because they want to see the cute naked chick sitting next to me. Yeah, so she. Wrote, I don't remember how many. I don't remember how many jumps I had, but but I I ended up on the casa at one of the boogies, and I I ended up sitting. It was a naked naked jump, and I ended up sitting across from Perry and uh, Perry's daughters, and uh, I, I they weren't completely naked, but I was so unnerved by. I was wearing a blue student suit. I think I had eighteen or nineteen skydives, <laughs> and I was walking towards one airplane, and all of a sudden, everyone kind of started walking towards the 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 uh, the casa. And they're like, are you a student? You're up front. I sat up front and the next thing I know, everyone's getting in. And then I, I literally, I don't remember if it was Amber and the other one's Ashley. Yeah. I don't remember which one. It was one with the dark hair. I, I was so locked on her eyes and she's very, I mean, both sisters are drop dead gorgeous, but I was locked on her. Just, she looked so, I mean, she was, she's absolutely gorgeous. Mm. There's that, she looks like an actress. I remember looking at her just being stunned, then realized she's wearing almost nothing. <laughs> and then that's when I became fascinated with watching the pilot fly because I just I didn't want to embarrass myself and stare at her all the way to altitude. I'm the guy with the big red geek helmet, you know, with the ear side things all taped right. up because my ear, I hate loud noises. And all I'm right. in and just gawk at these two gorgeous girls. Then I remember kind of glancing down the plane and went, 
And there's a half the load that's naked. Okay, I don't think I'm ever, and to this day, I never have had the guts. Everything else I've done crazy, but I've never been able to get. I've only naked done. Into I've a only done one naked skydive, and it went really poorly. So I won't ever do another one. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote an article about it. I ended yeah, up. Yeah, I think it, I read that. One. Yeah, it was it was jumping over Vegas, and and uh, um, it was a naked night jump, and I ended up having to use the uh, supermarket parking lot to land because it was a bad spot. Barefoot? Um, no, I had shoes on, but that's all I had on. Okay. With no wind. So imagine landing in front of the Vaughn supermarket on at like, I think it was like 8.30 at night on a Saturday, buck naked. <laughs> you were worried about, you, uh, there's a video of you running around in a bunny suit in Vegas or some kind of a, what was that video skit that you did where you were, you oh, ran no, around no, town? That was, that was in Jersey and that was me in, in uh, fishnet thigh highs and, and uh, um, booty shorts. <laughs> Dancing, yeah, dancing with with Diego, time. with my dog Diego, with a bright pink mohawk, and me and drag walking around <laughs> fucking Williamstown, New Jersey, for for half a day. Which, by the way, <laughs> I, won me the fucking uh, Cross Keys Film Festival Best Comedy and Best Overall Movie Award. Yeah, that, I do remember. Yeah, I do remember that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Just wa- just literally walking okay, around so, Williamstown, so, New Jersey, and drag. So you're in the longest relationship you've ever been in. No, the longest relationship I've ever been in is from is what got me my daughter, and that was about four and a half years. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Outside of that, the the average is the average for the long relationships was two years. Yeah. Okay, so you've been loved. So everyone out there, we know that Dean Dean has known love and yeah, is now. Yeah, I'm I'm in a in a long term committed relationship now with a, a a Finnish chick that's taller than me. <laughs> really? Yes. You do the Tom Cruise. The Tom Cruise thing. That's kind of nice. Yeah. Tall, beautiful, right. blonde. Yeah. So, go ahead. So, we've covered a lot of uh, my antics here. Yeah. We talked about the monkeys. Yeah. Um, I think the biggest question I think that I got, and you brought up the red and white pants, one of the stories that we, we did an eight way at one of, I don't remember which, which nationals it was, but, but, um, and this plays right into the red and white outfit that I had, but I, I got asked, I think, I think somebody either got hurt or couldn't get into the formation on an eight way group that we decided to do. And, uh, I got asked to go from camera cause Nick was with us and Nick goes into camera and then I decided to get into the, to the, to the eight way mm. and they had blown the exit. I watched the video. And so I get all puffed up for the first time because I'm usually pretty, I know I cannot belly fly like those guys can, mm. but for some reason I'd watch them do the exit and realize they'd, they'd blown it. And I said, just put me up front and I'll take you guys off like an AFF. Only I got really competent about it. Mm. I didn't just take them off like an AFF on the second jump. I ended up blowing the entire skydive and then going straight down through the middle and exploding everybody again and <laughs> absolutely destroying the skydive. So then we get McGowan and I want to say it wasn't uh, Jermaine. It was Brian. It was uh, Gerard came over to Craig kind of coach us up just to get Greg, just to get one freaking point. I mean, cause we could not get a point. Right. This was our first, I think it was like our first attempt at getting, um, I'm pretty sure it was our first attempt at, at doing eight way. Okay. So we, another person is having trouble even getting to the dive. So, we, so now McGowan's decided to join in on the group. And I, I, after making a complete ass of myself doing this, I'll take everybody off. Like an AFF put me in the base <laughs> Gerard pulls me aside, says, you're the camera flyer, right? Grabs a creeper right in front of Manifest, throws me on it. And they're all over somewhere else doing doing whatever they're going to do. And they're right. like, your next jump is a difficult one because you're you, – and it's a really good picture. you got to be in the, fit, the front of this skydive, and I need someone like a camera flyer who can just – I'm going to, I'm going to set this up different and you're just going to fly in your belly. And mm. then the way the jump looks is my, I'm facing away from a big line of people. And so there, it looks more like a big long line and the two people on the end are facing away in the opposite direction. I don't know what, what that, what that's called, but you end up with two people opposite of each other and then everyone's connected. And, and then the, the, the two people usually dock on the ends last because they've got to kind of slide in, but they decided to just have Matthews go out get on his belly, get flat. He's got that big asinine red and white suit and everyone will see him and then they can all kind of dock on that. That was the only jump I pulled off. And I want to say that was number four, number five. So I'm building up a little bit more confidence. And then we do, I want to say it's either jump seven or jump eight. It's the last jump of the day. And we got to find the video. It's hard to describe the way I remember it was 
we came out of the plane and I take out the base <laughs> trying to get to it. So I go low, right? Then I get big and come up back through the base. So now I've taken them out again. Twice. Everything explodes. Right. Right. So now I'm off to the side. So I come barreling back towards it, overshoot it, and take out the other side of what is starting to form, just missing McGowan. McGowan then decides, I'm just going to back up and watch this nightmare. So then you see me go underneath McGowan, come back around the side of McGowan, then kind of a big ass turn, come around and then hit somebody fall back down below them, then get big again, come back up underneath somebody. And this was all happening in one jump. <laughs> they flip over, but they get back to the jump. And then I finally come around. I'm probably missing another couple screw ups. Then I come around, do a spin, and I, I join the formation backwards with the wrong arm. So now I've got to turn around and then I'm still got the wrong arm and everyone's pointing at me. And then finally I make the reach just in time and you know, if you when you watch the video, it flashes one point. So that was the one Scott that we got one point. Besides that, that like jump number three. That is fantastic. So it's the last jump of the day. So I, of course, put all my gear down. I've got my packer. I, I think it was Paris. I've got my packer. She's excited because she, she knows she's, she's about to get paid. And uh, I go running into the bar to get a cocktail. And they're watching that jump over and over and over <laughs> in the bar. And, and 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 the crowd that's watching it is kind of like, come on, come on, oh, oh, come on, come on, here he comes again, here he comes again, oh, oh, okay, yeah, he's coming, he's coming, he's coming, oh, I mean, it just keeps, <laughs> you just keep seeing this red asinine dart keep coming through the frame of the video, taking out everybody, and then finally you seem to get the point, and then they play the video over again, and I remember looking over at it, and it took me a minute to realize it was me, and then people started looking over towards the bar and realizing. Hey, and then everyone looks over. Hey, it's him. Hey, that's the guy. <laughs> that's awesome. You should have done a victory lap in said, the red and white suit. I walked. I would, dude. I walked out. I said, "Hey, Dawson, can I borrow your suit tomorrow?" Wear <laughs> <laughs> this. He's like, "Hell no, Bubba. I'm wearing that. I'm famous. I'm famous." Oh, <laughs> Jesus Christ. So, who the ratings uh, podcast you did was pretty good. Yeah, but you didn't know that I was a tamen. But you didn't know that I was a Tamman examiner. No, I didn't have a clue that you were an examiner. <laughs> Neither did I. Jesus, how the fuck did you? How? How? <laughs> my first year, I was a Tamman examiner and I didn't know it. So I get my packet in the mail. I've got all my stuff. And there's this little blue card in there. And it says I have to mail off 20 bucks and, and some other paperwork and stuff. And I fill it out and I catch Ray in an off moment. He's not paying attention and he has to sign it. And I send it all off, and they send me my stuff, and I'm a TAM examiner. I had no idea. I just figured that was all part of the whatever. Remember I told you the story about how I, I had flared too high and had to PLF Jay Stokes? Yeah. And then, well, on the last jump, his wife was going to drive up and pick him up. In a rush, he either checked the wrong box on the form, or and so they sent me all the TAM, or TAM Jay examiner. Jay Stokes has got an awesome sense of humor. <laughs> No, I can't wouldn't do that. There's no way. There's no way. So <laughs> when I get I get it in the mail. It's time to renew my tandem examiner. And I'm thinking, I always thought I was a tandem instructor, but I, whatever. So I go into Ray's office and I said, Hey, I've got this stuff. I got a, I needed a signature here. And looks at it. Like, the look on his face, he looked up at me and he said, You're you're not a tandem examiner. He said, I've been doing tandems here, Ray, for a year. And he again gets this perplexed look, and he said, but "Where were you doing tandems before?" And just, it just, he doesn't. And he, as fast as he entertains that thought, he just drops it from his mind, picks up the phone, dials a couple of numbers, <laughs> waits for someone to answer, and he goes, "You got a Matthew so and so tandem examiner?" Well, he's not, and slams the phone down. <laughs> he takes all the paperwork, rumples it up, throws it in the trash. He goes, "You're a tandem instructor." That's Thank awesome. You. Get out of my office. That's awesome. That's <laughs> classic Ray right there. <laughs> I remember, I remember telling Milan he thought it was fine. I remember telling Keith, and you could see the look at Keith's eyes going, Ooh, you could have. <laughs> we, we could have done something with that for last year. Yeah, we you should have told me. Oh, we could have had a little fun with that. Holy shit. A tandem examiner. Yeah, yeah, no, no. Junior is the one you were talking about, uh, and he's legitimately a heads up, very good tandem examiner. He didn't accidentally get her, his because uh, he was pile drived into the ground too hard by you. <laughs> so, what else you got on that list? Yeah. That's what I'm looking at you right now. Everyone, okay, but yeah, and then a lot of the comments I got were t people teaching me how to speak. 
So Carl Mayer, do you remember Carl from South Africa? Uh, I think so, yeah. Yeah, so he, he came to town, stayed with us for a little while, and then Milan told me that his nickname was Pufta. Pufta, I think I'm saying it right. Pufta or Pufta. So I started calling him that for a while, and he always got this kind of a really shitty look on his face, and then he finally told me what it meant. He was not not amused. I think that's either – it's some kind of a very derogative, uh, it's, nasty it's, term. It, it's fag. Is, oh, okay. Yeah, I thought it was jackass or no, it's, it's dipshit fag. or – it's pretty offensive. Oh, okay. So, so I was calling Carl. <laughs> so, yes, you, you, you were you – were... So I was calling, hey, fag. Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. <laughs> Of course. Uh, this this is one that I had forgotten. Getting my coach rating with AV wearing a base rig, and I had forgotten about this. Uh, wait. And also, AV take AV. So remember AV, right? Oh yeah. Take he was out, running a base dude. rig. He was running a base rig in the in the. Uh, this is when did you been, you know what this is this is good this is a good segue. When did you get to Davis? Oh six. Okay, so I, that that makes sense because this was we were we were flying the uh, the Cessna, but it wasn't it wasn't all geared up yet, which is the reason Ray wanted to get a pack so bad. Yeah, and I was get we were we so Keith was really good about doing the night before telling you know, we do Keith would do a pre class whatever instruction class was going to do, and he would tell everybody you're all going to fail. You, right. you, but even, if you try this, you might you might pass. And you know Keith's <laughs> Zen master number two for me, so. But anyway, so yeah, so so, uh, so AV because he liked me at this point, and I'd helped him out a couple times. Like one time, and I, you know, get his rig back one time, another time, giving him some legal advice to get a rig rig that uh, he thought was going to get impounded, and and um, so he uh, he volunteered to be my student for my coach rating, and did the whole damn thing in a base yeah, rig, and I had no idea. Oh Jesus Christ! I had no idea. Yeah. He, he kept telling me. When we got to the airplane, don't give me a gear check. Just leave it out. And I won't tell anybody. And so on the last jump, he doesn't pull. And I'm thinking, oh my God. Well, he doesn't even try. He just flips me off and smiles and backs away and then tracks towards the barn and Jesus. just keeps on tracking and keeps on tracking. And I'm thinking, I, and then I pull, I settle and I look back and he's still tracking. And I think, what is he? That can't be. And then, whoop, just like you see in the pictures, one little turn and. Oh, man, Jesus Christ. So. I had no idea. Oh, man. Oh, man. Oh, man. Now. Which is why, I, which, which is to this day, I still, I'm so glad. I mean, I told you the story about my, my one opportunity to go on a base jump yeah, was yeah. when Karen first moved into the double wide, threw yeah. the gear down and said, you want to go jump? I packed it. You, you could pack it if you want to. You've done one, right? I'm like, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then he was getting all of this stuff together. It's like 11 o'clock at night and I'm not quite shit based enough. And he looks over at me kind of funny and he says, how much have you been drinking? How many jumps do you have? I said, well, I've never, never jumped before. <laughs> oh my God. And he starts throwing all the stuff back in his room. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Smart <laughs> man. See my ground crew. Smart man. Now, so that, that was with all my injuries and all the stuff that I ever did. That that's one. That's another thing too. That I I, I had quite a few cutaways, and I I there was no way I would have been. I wasn't. I was good on my belly, and I was a hell of a camera flyer because I was like four scuff. I could fall on my face, but I was not technical enough or skilled enough to ever. I mean, I had a wingsuit. I bought a wing. I bought a PHI wingsuit from Kieran because he bought it too. It was too big for him. Remember the PHI came out and it was supposed to be the one size fits all and you could buy, you know, based on, they had like five or six different sizes per range. You didn't, yeah. have, to, you didn't have to go through the full measurements and, it, and I could not get it to inflate. So I did five or six jumps. I think it was fast Eddie out of Lodi trained me up and I didn't quite get it. And it was just too many extra things. I didn't have a tandem rating yet and I didn't have AFF and I just could not get that thing to, to do anything. And I think it was jump nine or 10, uh, Kieran had finally gotten his in and he put his on and he lost a wing or lost one of the, the handles. Mm. And it was the first time I had gotten close to getting to him or he was either just trying to get to me and he lost one of his handles and went into this violent spin. And I'd never seen anything like that. He just turned into a, mm. I mean, it, 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 I'd never seen anything so violent. And then he pitched and I, I remember slowing down and pitching and thinking, no, this is, I'm, a, I, I'm done. This wingsuit thing is not for me. It's too, 
I'll stick with what I know. Sure. Because with all my injuries and everything else, it it was just one extra thing and and, and too many extra things to think about. And so, yeah, that I never got into wingsuit jumping as well. So now, did you? Now you did or board for a long time, but you never actually. Did you ever try to to actually jump a board? Yeah, I jumped a board. I don't know. I've got like 15 board jumps and then a bunch of time flying the board in the wind tunnel in Vegas. Um, so really, yeah. So I'd spent some time with the, the board on my feet, but, uh, it never really appealed to me. The camera side of it always appealed to me much more. Uh, and then to be perfectly I was so honest, in 2000, I was so surprised in 2000 that that was the most, the most talk when people came to the drop zone, that was the most talked about, you know, people that wanted to do tandems. If I was doing the tandem class, that was the most talked about thing that they had seen on TV or that they recognized. Yeah, was, well, was, the only thing they'd seen is, is, is the, the, you know, sky surfing. That was what, you know, hit the X games and became this big thing. And, and then there was the free flying made a bit of a debut, but people just didn't really understand it. Uh, and I happened to right. get into uh, the, the, the sky surfing portion of things right at the very, very end. Uh, and I think the, the, the nail in the coffin for, for sky surfing was uh, Sean McCormick's invisible man move uh, because it required duct tape to keep from bursting blood vessels during the routine because it was such a violent move uh, and such an impressive move. Uh, and it just, uh, yeah, it just kind of faded from there. You know, and it uh, that was not to be too much of a downer, but was it was it your teammate that died? No, 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 no. Um, she is still going strong. Mary Tortomasi is still in Paris Valley. Ran the the wind. Oh, so we, okay. I thought it was a guy. No, no. So oh, but, I, okay. Th- there I, was a board. There was a famous board guy that that went in. Oh, dude, there's the the uh, curse of sky surfing. So um, you had um. I can't even actually count how many people directly related to sky surfing uh, that have gone in. It's been ridiculous. I actually got my first camera job because Vic Papadato, who was at the time the X Games uh, champion camera flyer, had just died on a skydive in Las Vegas at the drop zone that I went to. Uh, and I ended up shooting video because of him. Uh, Rob Harris died uh, shooting a Mountain Dew video. That's probably who you're thinking of. Uh, I mean, it's... It, yeah. it, it, Patrick he had a Degardon. white jumpsuit that he wore quite often. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Patrick de Gardon uh, passed away. He, uh, of course, is the inventor of of sky surfing, but he died on a wingsuit jump. Uh, you know, I mean, it, it, it yeah. It, there was this just this. I, I don't want to say curse to, to sky surfing, but definitely a high fatality rate to sky surfing. Well, I, I never looked at it as a fatality rate. I just remember, I, I think it was was it Brett Hahn at the drop zone that wanted to really get into it, and yep. you gave him a couple of tips, and yep. and then I remember you telling me, I, it's just it's something you just don't. I mean, it's going to take him hundreds of jumps to perfect, and I just don't. I, it was. It, I, I think you at first you thought it was kind of cool that somebody was interested in actually sure. trying it because there was no one else that's got a that's got a that's got a, it's doing that. A couple yeah. people gave him some tips on how to cut the board away, and I think they rigged some stuff up to show him how to do it. But I remember you telling me, I just don't see it, and I, and I remember thinking, how do you how do you have the? I mean, and then that's when I heard the story that you've been involved in that side of the sport, and and you just we were able to tell that that based on his skill level and 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 his and he eventually I think lost interest because he never felt he got that proficient well, at it. At least that that's was, what he told me at one point. That was the thing was, uh, and uh, it's stretching my memory a bit, but uh, if I'm not if I remember correctly, it wasn't whether or not he was skilled enough to do it. It's the drive that you have to have to want to do that because you've got a dead I mean that board is hardcore it's and he was starting out on a relatively small board but especially when you get to the larger boards like the Tom Stanton boards uh you're talking about a board that's as tall as as a person and it's honeycombed and ridiculously light and it's like strapping a propeller to your feet it's insane the forces that go you know into flying sky surfing and the guys that did perfect it took years to get there you know i mean starting out on itty bitty little surf flight boards and then finishing off on these massive tom stanton boards and it just See, and that's another thing that's that's like base camp to me i mean I, to me it looks so simple so i think that's why whenever one would come into the gear room and talk about it, it, it you know i'm suiting them up for a tandem and they'd be oh hey, do you guys do this here did, you know, did does anybody do this and they you know they were calling it snow air snowboard and all these sure. different names. Yeah, yeah. Same thing. Same thing with wingsuits. I mean, I, I ended up buying a wingsuit because I'd seen video of it, and it it, it didn't look easy. It just looked um, not that difficult sure. because they make it look so easy. Well, yeah. I do remember when I saw the first squirrel, thinking that's 
that looks like it actually is kind of easy because it's so efficient and flies sure. so damn well sure. that that's going to make some people want to go lower and lower and lower. And I mean, I remember when Billy, uh, di didn't he get a land speed record for one of his swoops? And I remember thinking, if you do the physics and the calculation, that means he did everything about seven things just right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And so... So that means you got to pick one of those seven to just get it a little bit faster oh, yeah. to get that extra quarter of a mile an hour until you finally find that that's the limit for now until yeah. they come up with the next parachute or the next technology or, but someone will have to die. It seems like, and that's a shame, but it seems like someone has to, 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 to auger in or, or to really hurt themselves badly before we learn and, and, and take that next step. Yeah, but no, it's true. you always, it, and I could be just speaking for myself, but I always seem to, to look at something on video or, to, and, and, and think it doesn't look easy, but you know, the first time I was in the tunnel, it, it, it that was a humbling experience, but oh, also, yeah. I mean, McGowan, that was yeah. a huge learning experience. Well, I guess I'm lucky. I mean, skydiving has always been a relatively humbling experience to me. I've never, I've been good at things in skydiving, but I've never excelled. I never thought I was going to be a world champion at anything in skydiving. And that has actually worked to have, my benefit. Do you still have that mental, so before it was a road, you know, a road sign or, or a, a place on the way to the drop zone where you would tell yourself, if I get past this point, I'm, I'm making my skydive. And that's just, right. I'm going to spend my day training. Right. right. Do you, do you have a mental, like you, I, I, I've, I've heard you talk about taking breaks. I've heard you talking about that first jump back was a little bit nervous. I've heard sure. you talk about different, but if, has there ever been a period where you, an incident or an event or a period of time where you said, oh, I'm going to stick with the pilot seat or I'm going to, I'm going to, this is, I'm good. Uh, well, you know, I, I guess I'm lucky at, at this point in my skydiving career, it's all about fun. So if the idea of going out and making a jump or making a bunch of jumps for a day doesn't excite me and isn't really a fun idea, then I just don't do it. Uh, you know, where, because for so many years, skydiving was how I paid the bills. You know, there was no choice. It didn't matter if I wanted to skydive. I had to go skydive. I got to pay the bills. I got to put food on the table. I got to pay the rent. Um, and for the majority of my skydiving career, that was the case. Uh, now it's. Are you having, were you, were tandems at Davis more fun because they were, there weren't as many and you could be more involved and you could uh, get more phone numbers and, yeah, I mean, and I have more fun with it? Because you seem very relaxed. Or when you were at the tandem mills, like you used to talk about, were you, were you that relaxed or were you just go, 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 oh, go? Oh, no, I was, I was go, go, go. Like I came to Davis from Cross Keys. So I came to uh, Skydance from the busiest drop zone in the U S at the time, you know? So I went from doing 25 plus tandems a day, um, Friday, Saturday, Sunday to, you know, Davis where you do six or eight, you know, which is ridiculously low key in comparison See, to me. That's, that's to me, that's high numbers. 10 in a day when I did it with Jay Stokes, it's like, oh my God, I'm going to die. Oh, but remember, no. again, I think I mentioned this in the last podcast. I never, I looked at you guys like rock stars. And, and I mean, I loved AFF, don't get me wrong, but I, the tandem rating, and it's like everything else. It's like the wingsuit jump. I never tried the boarding it, it, or the base jumping. Either somebody told me before I, I, I entertained going, or somebody would point out the fact that oh, why don't you get a little bit better at what you do? Someone would always gently sort of say, "You're you're already going to be in the hospital in, in in you know what? How many jumps you got now?" And they would divide it by three hundred and go. So you're only about you know 150 <laughs> jumps away from your next hospital stay. So why don't you stick with what you're doing? You're you're doing great, good camera and. Uh, so yeah, yeah, stick with that. So yeah, I ended up selling the wingsuit, and but there, the, the the first jump for me was because I remember being an ass. I think I was talking to Morgan on the phone, and I wanted, I I thought I could do like eight jumps that first day. I was like going to do the first jump course, and I was I stayed up all night long, and I was I was going to pound out eight jumps and get my solo rating by the evening. And right. I remember getting in the van after the jump was done and just being overwhelmed i think the adrenaline hit but in a bad way i've only sure. had a couple of experiences where i was overwhelmed with adrenaline one was a cutaway that i should have cut away and i didn't it was a spinner at uh at paris and it, it was a, a simple little teen line over i could not figure it out it wasn't scaring me so i wasn't going to cut it away but i wasn't looking at my altimeter and i took it way low in fact when i finally got on the ground dan is it dan in in uh manifest dan the super cool yeah, guy yeah, yeah dan it not the NBC, the other guy. Yeah, uh, yeah. He's, he's really, he's, he's like you on yeah. your PA in the airplane. Yeah, manifest. You got a PA yeah. in your airplane yet? No, I don't. 
you got a P8 they won't they won't let me talk <laughs> God, that, that's just that's that's in your it's in your DNA. Yeah. But anyways, so so yeah, the first the first jump getting in the van for me was, I don't know. This is again one of those things that I think I bit off more than I could chew, and then it became a, just an absolute determination. And I think the the every different aspect of the sport, um, with with the exception of being a tandem examiner, which I had no idea. But you know, base jumping, wingsuit flying, everything I would try, or with the exception of base jump would try or get involved with having to help someone after their injury or get involved in it. And, and then, and I had the a sense of knowing, no, this is not, I, I'm, I'm going to stay in my lane. I'm sure. having a good time sure. and I'm breaking enough stuff as it is. And I've only got so many more, sure. I, you know, well, and I'm kind of the same way, put you know, in my closet. I'm not, I'm the same way. I found my lane and I, I, uh, I really have no need to try and get out of it. And, uh, um, especially with the shit that they're doing nowadays, I'm not going to be, you know, doing this insane, incredible stuff that they're doing. I'm a fan and I like being a fan uh, this, like this podcast is kind of my avenue to, to do something slightly different in the sport. Uh, otherwise I thoroughly enjoy sitting in the pilot seat, listening to tandem scream as they go out the door. And, uh, I mean, just kind of watching it all happen. And then when I decide I'm going to go fun jump, go, you know, you do a you know hop and pop or two or or maybe chase co pilots around and see and I, and I and I think that's where some of these comments that I got about envy is you know and I and I think I mentioned this in the, in the last podcast but I, a lot of people look at you as 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 an enigma in the fact that I mean you you go where you want to go you do what you want to do you seem to do it well have fun at it and then lose interest like with girls or with, <laughs> with, with whatever you're doing and off you go with the same smile you have right now yeah. and you're on to the next thing. Like I was surprised when you said you were going to do base camp again because I thought you, there must have been something left un, unsaid in your head or undone in your mind that, yeah. that you were going to go back. You, you seemed, I mean, I could hear it in your voice when you said, oh, yeah, I'm going again. Oh, but no. I thought you were going to say and now I'm doing this next thing. No, no, for sure I'm going back. There were a couple of things I didn't do that I wanted <laughs> to do, and, and I don't like leaving things undone. You know, uh, um, it's it's not uh, – I don't. I don't give a fuck what anybody else thinks. Uh, well, I suppose that's not true. I do to to a certain degree, but when it comes to accomplishments, it's all about what I feel I've accomplished. You know, and I think most. People I'm not talking are... about. So, I'm not. I'm not talking about so much accomplishments. I'm talking about, and, and I'm not. I'm not trying to 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 pretty you up too much here. But fuck, dude, you're in bot. You're you're. you're... <laughs> You are, you're, 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 we're all, most of us are going to stay in California. We're, you know, we, we've got one or two drop zones we've been to. You've, you've gone from tandem to, to, uh, the, the cockpit back to tandem, done some fun <laughs> jumps. You, you started a podcast. I mean, at first it, it, it sounded ridiculous. I think it's become popular. At least I love it. Um, and then every now and again, there'll be a picture of you sleeping in some mosquito tent covered, whatever in the beach with, with, you know, Brad or wherever you guys go. And, and, and for, for the most of us, we just don't have, it seems like we don't have that time in our day. It seems like we don't have that ambition, I guess you would call it. And, and you always have that grin like, well, I'm just here, I'm just doing what I'm doing. I mean, you guys could do it too. It's not that big a deal. I mean, I, that seems to be your attitude. I know there's a lot more that goes into it, but fair enough. coming from my view, looking in, it looks like, and like what you said, oh, she, you know, my daughter, she's the one that's got the brains in the family. I say bullshit. I think you're living your dream. And I, and I used you. When I told Jack, you got to do what you want to do. And my daughter, I said the same thing. You got to do you know, it, it. It was difficult to, to use you as, a, as, as an example because Tiffany didn't know you as well as Jack. Plus, I <laughs> Plus, why the fuck terrible. would you use me as an example? For well, if you didn't know, she, well, because if you didn't know she was my daughter. I told you the story about the first time Tiffany showed up at the drop zone. Mika ran into his team room, took his his uh, his uh, one piece uh, guano suit off, and came out in his underwear to put it back on. I mean, he didn't know it was my daughter, right? But <laughs> and I remember I remember Sal Cohn looking at him like, "What are you doing?" Oh, and he goes, "I'm hot." And then he's like, and then you know, Tiffany walks over. So that's what you guys jump in, and oh, and he's like, yeah, it's really kind of hard, difficult to get on. You got to put one leg in, and I'm thinking, God, Maker, I can't wait to do it. It's my daughter. That's awesome. I mean, this is just a natural. Some guys have that natural charisma, and, and uh, yeah. oh, that's awesome. But yeah, so no, I, I don't think I, I'm not. I'm not talking about accomplishments so much as it. It just seems like you're living the dream, and 
Well, I and think the, that's... the decision to make, to make those leaps seem to come easy for you. It's um, that, does that make sense? Irresponsibility comes very easy to me. Yeah, <laughs> and it is that. Yeah. I don't know if it's irresponsible. It doesn't seem like that. I mean, there's a picture of you standing next to an airplane in front of a C, what is it, C500, you know, Mercedes, and 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 you're thinking that's that's like some of these comments. Bullshit. He rented all that crap, or those chicks are all rented. <laughs> we saw one in the magazine, and he just has enough balls to actually figure out how to get her to come hang out with him. He used to be a stripper. Of course, he knows ex strippers. <laughs> And I'm like, no, those weren't strippers. Those, none of those girls looked like they were strippers. No. Do you, remember, do you remember standing out in front of the hangar and we're in this big group and I think it was a fuel load and there's a bunch of gals we're all doing tandems with and one of them one of them was standing next to you and she's staring at you kind of funny and she goes, I know you from somewhere. You look really familiar. And I quipped, you ever been to Vegas? You just got I me mean, laser eyed me. She goes, yeah, you know what? <laughs> like, yeah, you probably did you get married in Vegas? He was probably at your honeymoon. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Uh, um, no, it's your bachelorette party. I'm finally now at the age where they see the gray whiskers and don't they don't pay much attention to that story anymore, which is funny. I think it's hilarious, but yeah, yeah, you know, no, I, I honestly I just kind of go with whatever feels right, and I've been very lucky. I've Forrest gumped my way through life, you know, it's, yeah, I mean, I actually, I mean, that, that's one of the, one of the comments I can't remember because I, I don't remember who wrote this, uh, where, where, cause the way it was worded was hilarious. Oh man, where did I put it? I love that you've taken notes on all this. <laughs> Matthews quit trying to be the Forrest Gump. You're talking to the Forrest Gump that finds himself, chases his dream, seems effortly to land in the most unbelievable places. For Christ's sakes, he was a stripper. Uh, stop, stop lying, unless it's on video, and saying, oh, yeah, I can ski and ride a motorcycle, etc. Bullshit, I saw you almost kill yourself on a motorcycle racing the airplane. I forgot about that part. That's awesome. That's awesome. Chris, yeah, Chris Hackler and I raced the airplane one time, and I don't know whose motorcycle. I think it might have been. No, it wasn't Nick's. It was somebody else's. They they had just gotten a crotch rocket, and uh, – I uh, I was gonna race the pack, and so I'm on the um, I'm on the the uh, what do you call it, the taxiway? Yeah, yeah. And uh, and he guns it, and we're going, and everyone's looking out the window, and I'm just hauling ass, and he lifts off, and he just kind of stays level with the runway, and then he starts to point, like the pull signal, and I'm thinking, what, well, what, what? And he's pointing at the end of the, I'm running out of the taxiway, of and I'm going so. as fast as the pack, which is how fast is that? Oh, well, you're probably doing. Now, if he's if he's it, 80, 90 miles an hour? Yeah, yeah, about, yeah. My hat's off and everything else, and all of a sudden, boom, into the dust, into the dirt. I'm out, and it stayed upright. That bike stayed upright. I took it to the double wide and hosed it off before I took it back to, to the owner. I bet you But But, uh, yeah. Yeah, no, oh, there man. I have dozens of stories where we did stupid stuff like that. <sighs> I, You know, and that, that that's what, what was a shame was it seemed like I always – the really nasty injuries I seemed to avoid. The only really – my moment was – the Pat McGowan to me loss was well that and Allison. Those two to me seemed unexplainable. Yeah, maybe Allison. Allison was... Maybe Allison, because it was it was so unexpected. But Pat was absolutely in my mind unexplainable. Sure, I well, couldn't I couldn't square. See, but that's kind of I mean uh, we're 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 trailing off on a bit of a sad note. But to be perfectly honest, when it comes to skydiving, they almost always seem to be. Uh, wow, I've never seen anything like that before, or this was unusual because, you know, I mean, or base jumping right. especially, and it always seems to be a, I didn't see this one coming, I didn't expect. Um, and I finally come to the grips with the fact that if and when I lose somebody in either skydiving or base jumping, I'm not going to see it coming. And it's going to be weird. And it's going to be something I don't expect because now with as many years as I've been in the sport and same with you, as many years as you've been in the sport, the people that we know, if they're still going big are fucking good. 
the people that we know, right. if they are still going that hard after this many years, are probably at the top of their game. So when you have someone that's at that level that doesn't make it through a jump, you know, it's it's shocking, and it's got to be something well, and crazy. That's, that that's what that's what shocked me because you know I would see McGowan. McGowan had this amazing ability to track away from the sky. It was crazy how far he could get away when everybody would break. One time I just filmed him to watch it happen. He had this way of sort of cupping his shoulders and he would just disappear. I mean, yeah. you know, the guy could track away from a skydive is amazing. But to, to have him have a proximity fatality like that, I just, I, I've, I'd never seen him pull anywhere near anybody. I'd never seen him play around in the air with anybody. I mean, yeah. obviously I didn't skydive with him that much, but usually we were all picking up our gear on the ground and and I'm you know usually the last person down on the ground it just seems to be that with the way that it works out with the way we jump or, or the load we're on and then McGowan would swoop the entire length of Paris or as much as he could um, 12 feet off the ground I mean he yeah. wasn't trying to get a toe on the grass he was just going over everyone's head at a safe level and just seeing how far he could get you know across the whole damn thing so yeah. it was just amazing to see that and, and then I'd ask him why you do that he goes well two things one it's I don't have to worry about the ground, so I can go as fast as I want. Right. I can play and learn and have a good time on my canopy. And it's great to see everyone hear me coming and turn around in shock and know that I'm 20 feet over their head. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. So, I mean, it just to, to have him put himself in, in a situation or to have him – maybe it was the other – I don't know. But to me, that was the one – that one caught me off guard and made me think, oof. Oh, it is. There is a little bit of randomness to this. Yeah, yeah, no, there, there definitely is, and I just kind of, uh, I've learned to expect the unexpected, unfortunately, and and uh, especially again because after so many years, most of the friends that I have have in the sport have been in it for so long now. If they're still actively jumping, they're either workhorses, um, you know, just right. doing their thing day after day, or they're pushing that envelope. Uh, and if they're the ones pushing the envelope, I, I mean, I hate to say it, but I'm not shocked anymore. It's It's been a long time yeah, since I've been truly much. shocked. Yeah, you just kind of go, oh, fuck. You know, and you may be, you may yeah. be surprised at the circumstances, but uh, the shock value is kind of gone out of it anymore, which is a shame. You know, uh, um, I, yeah. I, if, if I could actually have anything back at my time in skydiving, it would be the ability to be shocked and and uh, truly saddened, you know, at, at some of the losses that we've had. But uh, I'm almost numb. Well, to... and I, I I don't remember who said it, but I, I the Allison thing shook me up and and it was touching because, you know, they gave me a little vial of her, of her ashes. And I, I spread them over Santa Cruz and I, I just, I don't remember who said it, but someone said something like, you know, think of all of the, the, the people she touched, the impact she had and, mm. and what a wonderful person. And you got, you got to know Nick in a way, not just as a, you know, a student, but in, as a, and get to respect him as a climber, you got to see him in a wonderful relationship. You got to see him happy. I mean, they oh, yeah. lived in a tent with two dogs. Oh, yeah. I mean, they were an amazing couple. And then to have her go so suddenly, to 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 really worry about it or or to overthink it, I mean, you you, you have to celebrate because that smile that she had is well, infectious. Yeah, so that, I mean, that's what I think of. Well, yeah. and your your so, version of Allison for me, and and Allison was very important to me as as well as Nick still is. But uh, for me, it was Donnie Brown. Um, you know, I mean, right. Donnie, Donnie Brown, out of, uh, out of all the people that I've had to say goodbye to in the sport, Donnie Brown was the one that just. You, you had a really difficult time being sad for very long because if you thought about him for too long, you'd end up fucking laughing, you know, and you'd end up smiling. And to this day, my camera helmet is still painted uh, the way that he painted it simply because I asked him, he was a professional car painter, you know, and I, I asked him, can you just throw a coat of paint on this helmet? I don't jump anymore, but it's beat up and I want it to look nice. I'm going to keep this helmet forever. And he kept it forever and I forgot about it. And then one day he brings it back with this ridiculously, astoundingly beautiful paint job just because he, you know, he wanted to. He wanted to do something nice for one of his friends. Uh, you know, and it, that was just Donnie in a heartbeat. And it was his passing was kind of the the last real check for me the reality check was okay you're you're gonna lose people here um and, and it's you got to kind of look at the the brightest side of it 
Uh, and but Don with Donnie it was it, I mean there were so many facets to that personality that were <laughs> that were that were beyond skydiving. I mean I I drove to Yuba City one time to pick up my son who was going through a difficult breakup with a girlfriend and he was a teenager and it was his first big breakup and we get to the drop zone and Donnie's at the double wide and he's got that infectious smile he's laughing his ass off and Jack almost in, in tears asks him how do you do it how are you always happy and he gets real serious for a second and he says I'm not always happy. And then he bursts into laughter and Jack starts laughing and he says, but not very long. And then Jack just followed him around the rest of the weekend. Donnie spent the time with him and just hung out with him because Jack was down about a girl. And I was oh, yeah. able to talk to him a little bit, but I just I just couldn't. Donnie just had that way of getting Jack in a better mood. And by the end of the weekend, Jack was better. So it wasn't just a, as a skydiver that he was a oh, kick no. in the ass. No, I mean, no. I've never had a negative experience with Donnie. When I found out that, that what had happened, I was shocked. But at the same time, I just thought that that's a loss. That's oh, with yeah. McGowan. It was what a huge loss to the sport. But with Donnie was that's just a personality. That, that, oh, yeah. That, no, that's that, a, just a that's loss to humanity of for that's, sure. I mean, Donnie yeah, Brown, uh, so. I had uh, uh, my my one of my favorite memories will always be. And I've got pictures of the whole damn thing when he had to do some some impromptu painting and repairs to the the wingtip of a an airplane. That uh, accidentally brushed up against a, a hard. Surface. That wasn't the one I was involved. No, no, you weren't involved. Oh, in that. No, no, okay, that was you. Yeah, but so I had to get him to uh, to paint the wingtip of a, a of an airplane for me, and uh, uh, in an attempt to try and make sure that everybody was still happy, and he jokingly asked me, or jokingly said something along the lines of, "It would be so cool if I could put ghost flames." on here you know because i've got paint that you won't be able to see it unless you're seeing it from a certain angle and i'm like fucking do it man are you kidding me this is amazing so right. to this day out there there is a plane uh, owned by someone that jumps or that drops skydivers that has ghost flames strategically hidden on the left wing tip uh, uh courtesy of donnie brown and i've got pictures of him grinning ear to ear knowing that this is going to be reattached to to this plane that i'm going to go fly around the country and <laughs> that's that's probably yeah there's a picture there's a picture of Allison and, and, and Allison and Nick's wedding, and we we all go back to the hotel, and then uh, Donnie and I find the bar, but no one's there. There's no, there, in the picture, you can't even really see any bottles behind it, and we're both in tears laughing because we both want a beer or a drink or something so bad because we're out of booze or whatever it is, and someone captures the moment because I'm pointing at him like, we're just fucking drunks, and, and we're laughing our asses off, and then we just both turn at the camera, and I'm... I'm smiling that big because Donnie is. Oh, yeah. and, and that was the way, I mean, we could, we could point at each other and just start laughing. And I don't know why you were laughing. And then we're laughing more. And, it, and, and you have no idea what we're laughing about. And then, and then, and then he can't breathe. Now I can't breathe. Oh, yeah. And then it just continues. And so oh, one of yeah. us just stops. And then, and then it starts up again. And oh, I mean, you know, that I mean, it's amazing. Uh, over the years, I've said goodbye to a lot of people, uh, um, and most of the time that goodbye is, uh, um, you know, a remembrance on Facebook or a telephone call or, yeah, yeah. or emails back and forth. Um, but uh, uh, when we lost Donnie, I was living in the Caribbean, uh, flying for Seaborne Airlines, and I got on a fucking plane. Uh, oh, yeah, no, I put that, I put, I had, I had just gotten done with a, a major back surgery and I was walking and I yeah. put that together in the hangar. I remember that, that was yeah. one of the, that was one of the kindest things Ray ever did was I caught him in a bad mood. He was having a tough time with the aircraft and, and um, I, I don't remember who he was working with, but it was, a, it was a bad time for him and, and I needed a hangar because I said, we're going to have a lot of people. And, and uh, he, he just, he wasn't put off with the fact that he wanted to have a, a you know, memorial for Donnie. He, sure. It was just a bad time. And, I'd approached Jimmy because his hangar was right across from ours. And, and I remember his hangar was full of airplane and Aaron's helping to push all those out. And, and that's going to be a nightmare. And then Ray said, you know what, let me make a phone call. Cause I actually think one of the big, big hangars on the end is empty. And we filled and that, we filled that thing, thing up. full of chairs and it was standing room only. Oh yeah. 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 And it was, it was, yeah. uh, it was an amazing experience. And, and I remember cause I got on the plane in, in St. Croix and in, in the Virgin islands and it took forever to get there. And, and, uh, I got picked up by, uh, uh, Zach who rest in peace. He's gone as well, uh, in, uh, uh, San Francisco. And then we drove to Davis for the, uh, uh for the, uh, uh the, uh, event and, Standing room only in this massive hangar, hundreds of skydivers and non-skydivers alike. And uh, uh, one of my greatest memories of the sport in general and specifically for Donnie was the him, him, fuck him. Uh, it was yep. – and 
usually everybody screams him, him, fuck him, and it's a good laugh and this and that. And people were tears streaming down their face and laughing at the same goddamn time and uh, fighting off good and bad memories all the time. I mean, literally hundreds of people in this hangar echoing him, him, fuck him. And all I could think yep. was Donnie would have loved that. He'd be pissing his pants right now oh, yeah. if he could have heard that and of course there were yeah. probably three or four dozen non skydivers in there that are like w- uh what <laughs> what what what's going on they, but also what do you mean dude, fuck there him? was also this mood there was mood there was this mood of celebration oh, because yeah. we showed the slideshow and the pictures and everything else but there was also this 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 ver- uh, kind of a, a a melancholy because i remember a lot of people being worried about each other because donnie meant that much to some people to everybody. and i remember them being honestly concerned you know and and um i mean i you know i pulled meeker's underwear up over his ass and put him on his feet probably 20 times I'd never seen Mika that upset. I didn't know him and Donnie were that close. I just oh, yeah. thought Donnie was that, that close with everybody. Well, that's and, the thing, uh, too. Is so, I mean, yeah. if, if, if you were to ask me intimate details about Donnie's personal life, I wouldn't have them for you because we weren't what you would consider a stereotypically super close couple of friends. But I still loved him absolutely that much, as did everybody else. And the and the cool thing, and not about- to toot, but not to toot your horn, and and, and not to interrupt you, but but that that he's also one of those characters that lived life large and lived it full. I mean, he was into what everything from racing to motorcycles everything. to everything. you got God knows what, and always seemed happy. So there must have been some downtime, and I think that's why some of these comments that I got from our podcast last time, I think you people look at you that same way because we're not. We're not always that amazingly jovial or have that kind of an impact. And and I'm not saying you're the Donnie Brown. I mean, oh, God, I've no. seen you in a mood sometimes where, I mean, I'm way too much a of one time just to make oh, kill a Packer just to make a point to the other Packer. It was kind of funny. But um, the point being is that there are some people that are just naturally happy, naturally have people that gravitate towards them. And then and then there's others that just seem to find themselves in some of the most amazing places. And you're seeming to find those people that to talk to on this podcast, which I think is amazing because that's well, to us. We get to see different sides of people like with Ray Farrell. I mean, I had no idea that Ray was relaxed. Oh, yeah. And in Florida and calm. That's been the you greatest I mean? thing He's about this. Good. You got to yeah, that's been the greatest thing about this podcast is is I'm going after people uh, to to interview on the podcast, not because I think they're going to be good for the podcast, but because I fucking want to talk to them. These are people that I want to I want to hear their stories, and hopefully that comes through on the podcast. Is that this is somebody I want to hear something from, and that I think has real value. But at the end of the day, this podcast is 100 percent selfish. This shit is for me. If someone else is enjoying this, that's fantastic. Good. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. You know, this podcast is absolutely for me. If you're enjoying it, that's fantastic. If a bunch of people are listening to it, that's great. Otherwise, this podcast is something for me when I'm a 110 years old, I get to listen to all these fucking cool stories again because this whole thing was just for me. Uh, you know, and it's it's been a real privilege that I've been able to get some of the coolest people in the sport, uh, you know, ever to sit down and tell me their stories and their mentality and the way that they think and, and uh, um, why they've approached this sport and why they love it and love the people involved and, and what goes into it. And it's so for me, it's just been a joy. You know, this is this is well, we, left, we left it off last time with me hoping it gets bigger and hoping you get a sponsor and you become a micro influencer with the kind of thing. Now I'm hoping that you you start people start thinking of, of this as a forum for them to, to want to come to you and say, Hey, I, I'd like to, I'd like to share. I Cause that's so. that when you, when you approached me, I thought, I know I don't, there's just absolutely no way that I would, that I would fit into the, the caliber of the people that you're talking to. And then I kind of thought, ah, what the hell, I'll give it a shot. Yeah, I mean, you can edit half the crap out. And well, let's... But now we're talking about making, barbells out of toothpicks and oh dude yeah no man i mean that's that's it well and i'll i'll use that as a springboard i'll absolutely tell people that are listening to the podcast if you've got a fucking story to tell i want to hear it and i guarantee you other people do too um i say it at the end of yeah and i and and we could we could we could go back and forth for hours I, i mean literally i've never been out told stories people always have another version or okay that reminded me of this and that's the beauty of the bonfire yeah yeah, yeah. Oh, I love it when somebody tells my own story back to me, but different. 
We'll but, bring it back to 2020. What's the mood and the the tenure and the the not tenure? What, what what's the tone at the drop zone now? I mean, I you remember I've been away from the sport for a while, so I'm 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 2000. Well, I'm I'm 88, 89 to 2010, 11. Sure, is is my time frame. Okay, that's uh, quite a while ago. So I'm not, not, you know, and this is weird. Politics somehow finds its way onto Facebook, but it does not find its way. At least it didn't when I was around at the drop zone. So politics aside, what's the tone and party atmosphere? I mean, are people getting really serious and technical about jumping or is it still a bonfire? It's still still the same. And you've still got the jumpers that are fucking worried about that next point. And the jumpers that are just worried about having a good time. You got the jumpers that are trying to, you still get the guy coming into Peterbilt. Yeah. Did you still get the guys coming in the Peter belt belts and want to jump out the hangar and yeah, you're like, yeah. oh Christ, we gotta well, I, we gotta beat this guy out. Those are few and far between. <laughs> those are those are special characters. And and for those that don't know what Jim's talking about, you'll have to listen to the first Jim Matthews podcast. <laughs> yeah. we, we go into detail on that one. Well, hey, as we're rounding the two hour mark, I'm gonna get you to pick one last thing on your list that you wanna highlight, because I know you made a, a fun list and, and uh uh, one last thing to hit before we sign off, because we're pushing our luck with uh, uh, with skydivers if we hit more than two hours. <laughs> I hear you flipping papers. Okay. Right? Well, I, I'm not, well, the, the, some of these are mundane. I mean, we've got some golf stories. We've got some other stories. But, you know, they, I think I think you did a good job talking about uh, Billy Sharman and, and the van incident. That was funny. I've got about five or six different Billy stories here. But the problem with those are he's married, so we might not want to go there. We've got <laughs> this is <laughs> there's this one story. I am sorry, Billy. Uh oh. Uh oh. This is one this is one story. Somebody comes from like the, the you know the quick mart or whatever the hell it was, you know, by the freeway. Yeah, yeah. Somebody comes in and they're like, oh my God, we just ran into the some scruffy gal in pajamas. I mean, she looked okay, but she looked rough on the edges. She's walking around in pajamas saying she's looking for a drop zone. I think she's out of her gourd. And uh, God, I, I'm working, Ryan and I, you know, a bunch of people playing, you know, the guitar game. And, and all of a sudden, we're like, well, you didn't tell her about skydance and he's like god no no that'd be the last thing i would do and then about five minutes later billy walks in with her (laughs) he gets stopped to get beer (laughs) puts her in the van and just as he tails off telling us the story about this woman walking around i mean it was a young girl i mean she was got to be in her early 20s and she was after you know billy cleaned her up a little bit gave her a shower she looked pretty good took her for a skydive the next day but (laughs) You just finished telling us about this crazy woman wandering around in the parking lot looking for her drop zone, and then she comes walking in with Billy. I mean, Billy was that kind of guy that just seemed to find himself in those with that shitty grin. Yep. With a, with a really good explanation. I mean, the the the, the it, I, one of the stories that I think is is the we never talk about some of the pilot stuff that happened there, and we talk about you hitting on tandems and everything else. But Chris Hackler uh, popped up on Facebook the other day, and he's doing great. I mean, oh, when yeah. he first got to the drop zone, him and Diane, you talk about a great couple. What a supportive wife, and oh, yeah. he knew what he wanted to do, like you. So he he's chasing that career, and he shows up and he wants to build some turbine hours, and uh, he wants to be a, you know build up some hours to be a pilot. And then his plan really was, and I'm going to go to a vacation resort somewhere and do whatever. That's yep. what I my goals are. Yep. So he decides he's going to fix the pack one night. And they take it down to the big hangar and they tear it apart. I mean, they, they've got the seats out and they've got everything out. But we're, we went to bed and then we keep hearing Billy and him coming into the kitchen. And you hear bottles and stuff clanking around and then they disappear. Because remember, the double wide is attached to that large hangar. Right. And then pretty soon they're not being quiet about it. They're stumbling in. It's getting worse and worse. And finally we get out there and they're just putting the pack back together. It's like 3 a.m., and it looked really good. They were putting the rubberized blowers down and kind of redoing the seats and doing yep. some other stuff. Yep. And then, then they drove the pack square out in the field between the the, uh, the taxiway and the runway and got it stuck. <laughs> and broke the nose gear that Ray had just had repaired so it could actually make the turn. Yeah. 
because before I guess I you're the pilot. I don't know. It quite couldn't yeah. make the turn unless you did it just right. So yeah. Ray had just had the nose gear done, <laughs> and so rather than pull the pack to the drop zone, they decided to push the pack to the drop zone and pushed it right out into the field oh. with the nose gear cranked sideways and busted it. Well, then Diane shows up to pick up Hackler. Drives him home, puts him in bed. It's left to me to get the plane back and park it. I know how to drag the pack. And so I drag it back. I didn't notice anything wrong, and I didn't think to check anything. And we all loaded up for the load the next morning, and we got right on the numbers. And he throttled up and throttled it right back down. And apparently, I don't know what check you do to make sure you got a little bit of everything, but it only could turn one way. So that was (laughs) – he was able to (laughs) – the way we got in the plane – (laughs) <laughs> it turned that way, turned that way, and then he got it to get onto the runway, but then realized it doesn't, that's it. It only turns that way. <laughs> oh, and uh, it, it was, the, the happy thing about that was Ray still had all the other parts from the old, whatever the <laughs> linkage and everything was over back at the other. But Hackler was hilarious. He would tell, I'm not drinking tonight, I'm not drinking tonight. And then two hours later, of course, Diane's driving around in the Jeep trying to find him. Of and, course. But, yeah, we had some there, fun we had stuff a out there. Really- yeah, I remember having to change one of the tires of the packs. The, the last day I was flying there, wearing a skirt, <laughs> wearing that. Remember that? Wearing that white summer dress? Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Uh, you, you, every plane I've ever seen, you treat it like it's like it's your brand new car. Yeah, man. No, hell no. Are you kidding me? That shit's got to take care of me and all my friends. So yes, I, I baby the shit out of those airplanes, polish them, keep them right, happy, so, man. So- Wrap it up with this. So you're going back to base camp, but I was thinking you were. So what? What else is on your bucket list? That's I'm it, just man. Curious. I this mean, is just, uh, just for me. it's a. It's going to be Island Peak. Um, again, that's the Bunny Slope in Nepal. Uh, just to see if I can do it, and uh, um, one more trip out there because it was so fucking amazing. And then, man, it's going to be Bali on the beach. Bali on the fucking yeah. beach. Yeah, staying in one of the villas, and and uh, um, I, I think I've talked before about the villas that we've gotten. Bali, myself, and and uh, Junior, the my semi co-host on the on the podcast, and we've got a couple of villas in Bali, and and uh, we Airbnb them out. But eventually, I don't want to Airbnb them. I want to stay in one of them. And that's it. Right, know. right. Beach time, man. Yeah. So uh, I a few more years of flying and shit like that. And then it's on the beach for me, surfing and uh, pineapples and coconuts and relaxing. <laughs> I got to find that picture of you and, and Brad uh, from Australia. Yeah, that's where you we guys, were in Fiji. You, yeah, Fiji. And you sent us a picture and everyone was just pissed. And then someone photoshopped it. <laughs> yep, 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 yep. Yeah, it was uh, it was me and Brad there. And we <laughs> photoshopped uh, Neil's face bright red uh, uh, on the corner of the picture saying, you're fired. Because they jokingly yep. fired us when we left for Fiji for the, for the winter. <laughs> and then someone went ahead and photoshopped it again. Yeah, man. And that... that- that, that got stapled up under the wall for a while, and that was kind of, this is what they sent us, and this is what they get when they get back. <laughs> All right, brother. All right, well, th- Jim, man, thank you so much for taking round number two, uh, especially the, the, the fucking uh, um, the toothpick penis Hopefully we're story. off my genital area this year, and, and we can in 2020 we can start talking about some of these other comments. And, yeah, uh, no, I, th- I think we've got around three in us for sure. I know that you've got quite a few stories. We just may have to draw some of the uh, old crew out and, and see if we can't get a three-way conversation going on. <laughs> it'd be something yeah it man. would be something because it, there's there's some folks like you said i mean i i uh, yeah we, we can't do some of these stories justice if we're not talking to or at least commenting or getting a reaction from some of the other players involved I because agree. a lot of these antics i did not do on my own it always involved someone you know egging me on or you know we were playing off each other and the next thing you know we were <laughs> Well, let's see what we can arrange. 20, it was game on. 2020 is going right, to be bro. a good year, brother. Much Keep love, man. Up. Keep these podcasts coming. I look forward to Mondays. You got it. I really do. <laughs> Take care, brother. All right. Bye. Take care.